and opened them as though scattering the fragments. Van Helsing seemed surprised, and his brows gathered as if in thought, but he said nothing. 10th of September All last night she slept fitfully, being always afraid to sleep, and something weaker from when she woke from it. The Professor and I took it in turns to watch, and we never left her for a moment unattended. Quincy Morris said nothing about his intention, but I knew that all night long he patrolled round and round the house. When the day came, its searching light showed the ravages in poor Lucy's strength. She was hardly able to turn her head, and the little nourishment which she could take seemed to do her no good. The time she slept, both Van Helsing and I noticed the difference in her between the sleeping and waking. Whilst to sleep, she looked stronger, although more haggard, and her breathing was softer. Her open mouth showed the pale gums drawn back from the teeth, which thus looked positively longer and sharper than usual. When she woke, the softness of her eyes had evidently changed the expression, for she looked at her own self, although a dying one, in the afternoon, and asked for Arthur and we telegraphed for him. Quincy went off to meet him at the station. When he arrived, it was nearly six o'clock, and the sun was setting full and warm, and the red light streamed in through the window and gave more colour to the pale cheeks. When he saw her, Arthur was simply choking with emotion, and none of us could speak. In the hours that had passed, the fits of sleep or a comatose condition that passed for it had grown more frequent so that the pauses when conversation was possible were shortened. Arthur's presence, however, seemed to act as a stimulant. She rallied a little and spoke to him more brightly than she had done since we arrived. He too pulled himself together and spoke as cheerily as he could so that the best was made of everything. It was now nearly one o'clock and he and Van Helsing are sitting with her. I am to relieve them in quarter of an hour. I am entering this on Lucy's phonograph. Until six o'clock they are to try to rest. I fear that tomorrow will end our watching, for the shock has been too great. The poor child cannot rally. God help us all. Letter Mina Harker to Lucy Westenra, unopened by her. 17th of September. My dearest Lucy, it seems an age since I heard from you or indeed since I wrote. You will pardon me, I know, for all my faults when you have read all my budget of news. Well, I got my husband back all right. When we arrived at Exeter, there was a carriage waiting for us, and in it, though he had an attack of gout, Mr Hawkins. He took us to his house, where there were rooms for us, all nice and comfortable, and we dined together. After dinner, Mr Hawkins said, My dears, I want to drink your health and prosperity, and may every blessing attend you both. I know you both from children, and have with love and pride seen you grow up. And I want you to make your home here with me. I have left to me neither chick nor child, all are gone, and in my will I have left you everything. I cried, Lucy dear, as our Jonathan and the old man clasped hands. Our evening was a very, very happy one. So here we are, installed in this beautiful old house, and from both my bedroom and drawing room I can see the great elms of the cathedral close, with their great black stems standing out against the old yellow stone of the cathedral. I can hear the rooks overhead, cawing and cawing and chattering, gossiping all day, after the manner of rooks and humans. I am busy, I need not tell you, arranging things and housekeeping. Jonathan and Mr Hawkins are busy all day, and now that Jonathan is a partner, Mr Hawkins wants to tell him all about the clients. How is your dear mother getting on? I wish I could run up to town for a day or two and see you, dear, but I dare not go yet with so much on my shoulders. And Jonathan wants looking after still. He's beginning to put some flesh on his bones again, but he was terribly weakened by the long illness. Even now he sometimes starts out of his sleep, in a sudden way, and awakes all trembling till I can coax him back to his usual placidity. 
However, thank God, these occasions grow less frequent as the days go on. But they will in time pass away altogether, I trust. And now I have told you my news, let me ask yours. When I should be married? And where? And who is to perform the ceremony? And what are you going to wear? And is it going to be a public or a private up wedding? Tell me all about it, dear. Tell me all about everything. For there is nothing which interests you which will not be dear to me. Jonathan asks me to send you his respectful duty, but I do not think that is good enough from a junior partner of the important firm Hawkins and Harker. And so, as you love me, and as he loves me, and I love you with all the moods and tenses of the verb, I send you simply his love. Instead of goodbye, my dearest Lucy, and all the blessings on you. Yours, Mina Harker. Report from Patrick Hennessy, MD, MRCS, LK, QCPI, etc. To John Seward, MD, 20th of September. My dear sir, in accordance with your wishes, I enclose a report of the conditions of everything left in my charge. With regard to your patient Renfield, there is more to say. He's had another outbreak which might have had a dreadful ending, but which, as it fortunately happened, was unattended with any unhappy result. This afternoon, a carrier's cart with two men made a call at the empty house whose grounds are but on ours. The house to which you will remember the patient twice ran away. The men stopped at our gate to ask the porter of their way. As they were strangers, I was myself looking out of the study window, having a smoke after dinner, and saw one of them come up to the house, as he passed the window of Renfield's room. The patient began to rant from within, and called him all the foul names he could lay his tongue to. The man, who seemed a decent fellow enough, contented himself by telling himself to shut up for a foul-mouthed beggar, whereon our man accused him of robbing him and wanting to murder him, and said that he would hinder him if he were to swing for it. I opened the window and signed the man not to notice, so he contented himself by looking the place over and making up his mind as to what sort of place he'd got into by saying, Lord bless you, sir, I wouldn't mind what I said to me in a blooming madhouse. I pity ye and the governor for having to live in a house with a wild beast like that. Then he asked his way civilly enough, and I told him where the gate of the empty house was. He went away, followed by threats and curses and revilings from our man. I went down to see if I could make out any cause for his anger, since he is usually such a well-behaved man, and except his violent fits, nothing of the kind had ever occurred. I found him, to my astonishment, quite composed and most genial in his manner. I tried to get him to talk of the incident, but he blandly asked me questions as to what I meant and led me to believe he was completely oblivious to the affair. It was, I am sorry to say, however, only another instance of his cunning, for within half an hour I heard of him again. This time he broke out through the window of his room and was running down the avenue. I called the attendants to follow me and ran after him, for I feared he was intent on some mischief. My fear was justified when I saw the same cart which had passed before coming down the road having on it some great wooden boxes. The men were wiping their foreheads and were flushed in the face, as if with violent exercise. Before I could get up to them, the patient rushed at them, pulling one of them off the cart and began to knock his head against the ground. If I had not seized him just at that moment, I believe he would have killed the man there and then. The other fellow jumped down and struck him over the head with the butt end of his heavy whip. It was a terrible blow, but he did not seem to mind, but it seized him also, and struggling with the three of us, pulling us to and fro as if we were kittens. You know I'm no lightweight, and the others were both burly men. And at first he was silent in his fighting. As we began to master him, the attendants were putting a straight waistcoat on him. He began to shout, I'll frustrate them, they shan't rob me, they shan't murder me by inches. I'll fight for my lord and master. And all sorts of similar incoherent ravings. It was with a very considerable difficulty that they got him back to the house and put him in the padded room. One of the attendants, Hardy, had a finger broken. 
However, I set it all right, and he's going on well. The two carriers were at first loud in their threats of action for damages, and promised to rain all the penalties of the law upon us. The threats were, however, mingled with some sort of indirect apology for the defeat of the children by a feeble madman. They said that if it had not been for the way their strength had been spent in carrying and raising the heavy boxes to the cart, they would have made short work of them. They gave us another reason for their defeat, the extraordinary state of truth to which they had been reduced by the dusty nature of their occupation and the reprehensible distance from the scene of their labours of any place public entertainment. I quite understood their drift, and after a stiff glass of grog, or rather more of the same, and with each with a sovereign in hand, made light of the attack and swore they would encounter a worse madman any day and the pleasure of meeting so blooming good a bloke as your correspondent. I took their names and addresses in case they might be needed. They are as follows. James Smollett of Duddings Rents, King's George's Road, Great Walworth, and Thomas Snelling, Peter Farley's Row, Guide Court, Bethnal Green. They are both in the employment of Harris and Sons. Moving and Shipment Company, Orange Masters Yard, Soho. I shall report to you any matter of interest occurring here and shall wire you at once if there's anything of importance. Believe me, dear sir, yours faithfully, Patrick Hennessy. Letter, Mina Harker, to Lucy Westenler. Unopened by her. 18th of September. My dearest Lucy, such a sad blow has fallen us. Mr Hawkins has died very suddenly. Some may think it not so sad for us, but we both come to so love him that it really seems as though we had lost a father. I never knew either father or mother, so that the dear old man's death is a real blow to me. Jonathan is greatly distressed. It is not only that he feels sorrow, deep sorrow, for the dear good man who has befriended him all his life, and now at the end has treated him like his own son, and left him a fortune, which people of our modest bringing up is wealth beyond the dreams of avarice. But Jonathan frets it on another account. He says the amount of responsibility which it puts upon him makes him nervous. He begins to doubt himself. I try to cheer him up, and my belief in him helps him have a belief in himself. But it is here that the grave shock he experienced tells upon him the most. Oh, it's too hard, that sweet, simple, noble, strong nature such as his, a nature which enabled him, our dear good friend's aid, to rise from clerk to master in a few years, should be so injured that the very essence of its strength has gone. Forgive me, dear, if I worry you with my troubles in the midst of your own happiness. But, Lucy, dear, I must tell someone, for the strain of keeping up a brave and cheerful appearance to Jonathan tries me. I have no one here I can confide in. I dread coming up to London, as we must do the day after tomorrow. For poor Mr Hawkins left in his will that he was to be buried in the grave with his father. As there are no relations at all, Jonathan will have to be chief mourner. I shall try to run over to see you, dearest, if only for a few minutes. Forgive me for troubling you. With all blessings, your loving Mina Harker. Dr Seward's Diary, 20th of September. Start again. Dr Seward's Diary. Twentieth of September. Only resolution and habit can let me make an entry tonight. I'm too miserable, too low spirited, too sick of the world and all in it, including life itself, that I would not care if I heard this moment the flapping of the wings of the angel of death, and he has been flapping those wings for some purpose of late. Lucy's mother, Arthur's father, and now let me get on with my work. I duly relieved Van Helsing and his watch over Lucy. I wanted Arthur to go to rest also, but he refused at first. It was only when I told him that we should want him to help us during the day that we must not all break down for want of rest, lest Lucy should suffer, and he agreed to. Van Helsing was very kind to him. Come, my child, he said. Come with me, you are sick and weak, and you have had much sorrow, 
and much mental pain, as well as that tax on your strength that we know of. You must not be alone, for to be alone is to be full of fears and alarms. Come to the drawing room where there is a big fire, two sofas. You shall lie on one and I on the other, and our sympathy will be comfort to each other, even though we do not speak, and even if we sleep. Arthur went off with him, casting back a longing look on Lucy's face, which lay in her pillow almost whiter than the lawn. She lay quite still. I looked round the room to see that all was as it should be. I could see that the Professor had carried out in this room, as in the others, his purpose of using garlic till the whole of the window sashes reeked with it. And round Lucy's neck, over the silk handkerchief of which Van Helsing made her keep on, was a rough chaplet of the same odorous flowers. Lucy was breathing somewhat stertorously, and her face was at its worst. For the open mouth showed the pale gums, her teeth in the dim uncertain light seemed longer and sharper than they had been in the morning. In particular, by some trick of the light, the canine teeth looked longer and sharper than the rest. I sat down by her, and presently she moved uneasily. At the same moment there came a sort of dull flapping or buffeting at the window. I went over to it softly and peeped out by the corner of the blind. There was a full moonlight and I could see that the noise was made by a great bat which wheeled round, doubtless attracted by the light, although so dim, and every now and then struck the window with its wings. When I came back to my seat I found that Lucy had moved slightly and had torn away the garlic flowers from her throat. I replaced them as well as I could and sat watching her. Presently she woke and I gave her food as Van Helsing had prescribed. She took but a little and that languidly. There did not seem to be with her now the unconscious struggle for life and strength that had hitherto marked her illness. It struck me as curious that the moment she became conscious she pressed the garlic flowers close to her. It was certainly odd that whenever she got into that lethargic state, with a stertorous breathing, she took the flowers from her, but that when she waked, she clutched them close. There was no possibility of making any mistake about this, for in the long hours that followed, she had many spells of sleeping and waking, and repeated both actions many times. At six o'clock, Van Helsing came in to relieve me. Arthur had then fallen into a doze, and he had mercifully let him sleep on. When he saw Lucy's face, I could hear the hissing indraw of his breath. He said to me in a sharp whisper, draw up the blind, I want light. And he bent down and with his face almost touching Lucy's, he examined her carefully. He removed the flowers and lifted the silk handkerchief from her throat. As he did so, he started back. And I could hear his ejaculation, mine got, as it was some smothered in his throat. I bent over and looked too, and as I noticed, some queer chill came over me. The wounds on the throat had absolutely disappeared. For a full five minutes, Van Helsing stood looking at her, with his face at its sternest. And he turned to me and said calmly, She is dying. It will not be long now. It will be much different, mark me, whether she dies conscious or in her sleep. Wake that poor boy and let him come and see the last. He trusts us, and we have promised him. I went to the dining room and waked him. He was dazed for a moment, but when he saw the sunlight streaming in through the edges of the shutters, he thought he was late and expressed his fear. I assured him that Lucy was still asleep, but told him as gently as I could that both Van Helsing and I feared that the end was near. He covered his face with his hands, slid down on his knees by the sofa, where he remained perhaps a minute with his head buried, praying, while his shoulders shook with grief. I took him by the hand and raised him up. Come, I said, my dear old fellow, summon all your fortitude. It will be best and easiest for her. When we came into Lucy's room, I could see that Van Helsing had, with his usual forethought, been putting matters straight and making everything look as pleasing as possible. He'd even brushed Lucy's hair so that it lay on the pillow in its usual sunny ripples. When we came into the room, she opened her eyes, and seeing him, whispered softly, Arthur, oh my love, I'm so glad you've come. Kiss me. Arthur bent eagerly over to kiss her. 
That instant, Van Helsing, who, like me, had been startled by her voice, swooped upon him, and catching him by the neck with both hands, dragged him back with a fury of strength which I never thought he could have possessed, and actually hurled him almost across the room. Not for your life, he said, not for you, a living soul and hers. And he stood between them like a lion at bay. Arthur was so taken aback that he did not for a moment know what to do or say. And before any impulse of violence could seize him, he realised the place and the occasion and stood silent waiting. I kept my eyes fixed on Lucy, as did Van Helsing, and we saw a spasm of rage flit like a shadow over her face. The sharp teeth champed together, then her eyes closed and she breathed heavily. Very shortly after, she opened her eyes in all their softness, and putting out her poor pale hand, took Van Helsing's great brown one, drawing it to her, she kissed it. My true friend, she said in a faint voice, but with untellable pathos, my true friend and his, oh, guard him and give me peace. I swear it, he said solemnly, kneeling beside her, and holding up his hand as one who registers an oath. He turned to Arthur and said to him, Come, my child, take her hand in yours and kiss her on the forehead only once. Their eyes met instead of their lips, and so they parted. Lucy's eyes closed, and Van Helsing, who had been watching closely, took Arthur's arm and drew him away. And then Lucy's breathing became stertorous again, and all at once it ceased. It's all over, said Van Helsing. She is dead. I took Arthur by the arm and led him away to the drawing room, where he sat down and covered his face with his hands, sobbing in a way that nearly broke me down to see. I went back to the room and found Van Helsing looking at poor Lucy, and his face was sterner than ever. Some change had come over her body. Death had given back part of her beauty, for her brow and cheeks had recovered some of their flowing lines. Even the lips had lost their deadly pallor, it was as if the blood no longer needed for the working of the heart had gone to make the harshness of death as little rude as might be. We thought her dying while she slept, and sleeping when she died. I stood beside Van Helsing and said, Ah oh well, poor girl, there is peace for her at last. It is the end. He turned to me and said with grave solemnity, Not so, alas, not so, it's only the beginning. When I asked him what he meant, he only shook his head and answered, We can do nothing as yet. Wait and see. End of chapter 12of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13. Dr. Seward's Diary Continued. The funeral was arranged for the next succeeding day, so that Lucy and her mother might be buried together. I attended to all the ghastly formalities, and the urbane undertaker proved that his staff were afflicted or blessed with something of his own obsequious suavity. Even the women who performed the last offices for the dead remarked to me in a confidential brother professional way when she had come out from the death chamber. She makes a very beautiful corpse, sir. It's quite a privilege to attend on her. It's not so much to say that she would do credit to our establishment. I noticed that Van Helsing never kept far away. This was possible from the disordered state of things in the household. There were no relatives at hand, and as Arthur had to be back the next day to attend his father's funeral, we were unable to notify anyone who should have bidden. Under the circumstances, Van Helsing and I took it upon ourselves to examine papers, etc. He insisted upon looking over Lucy's papers himself. I asked him why for I feared that he, being a foreigner, might not be quite aware of English legal requirements, and so might in ignorance make some unnecessary trouble. He answered me, I know, I know, 
you forget that i am a lawyer as well as a doctor but this is not altogether for the law you knew that when you avoided the coroner i have more than him to avoid there may be papers more such as this as he spoke he took from his pocket-book the memorandum which had been in lucy's breast and which she had torn in her sleep when you find anything of the solicitor who is for the late mrs westenra see all her papers and write to him tonight for me i watch here in the room and in miss lucy's old room all night and i myself search for what may be it is not well that her very thoughts go into the hands of strangers i went on with my part of the work and in another half hour had found the name and address of mrs westenra's solicitor and had written to him all the poor lady's papers were in order explicit directions regarding the place of burial were given i had hardly sealed the letter when to my surprise van helsing walked into the room saying can i help you friend john i am free and if i may my service is to you have you got what you look for i asked to which he replied i did not look for any specific thing i only hoped to find and find i have all that there was only some letters and a few memoranda and a diary new begun i have them here and we shall for the present say nothing of them i shall see the poor lad tomorrow evening and with his sanction i shall use some when we had finished work in hand he said to me and now friend john i think we may to bed we want to sleep both you and i and rest to recuperate tomorrow we shall have much to do but for the tonight there is no need of us alas before turning we went to look at poor lucy the undertaker had certainly done his work well the room was turned into a small chapelle ardente there was a wilderness of beautiful white flowers and death was made as little repulsive as might be the end of the winding sheet was laid over the face when the professor bent over and turned it gently back we both stared at the beauty before us the tall wax candles showing a sufficient light to note it well all lucy's loveliness had come back to her in death and the hours that had passed instead of leaving traces of decay's affecting fingers had but restored the beauty of life to positively i could not believe my eyes that i was looking at a corpse the professor looked sternly grave he had not loved her as i had and there was no need for tears in his eyes he said to me remain till i return and left the room he came back with a handful of wild garlic from the box waiting in the hall but which had not been opened and placed the flowers among others on and around the bed and he took from his neck inside his collar a little gold crucifix and placed it over the mouth he restored the sheet to its place and we came away i was undressing in my own room when with a premonitory tap at the door he entered and at once began to speak tomorrow i want you to bring me before night a set of post-mortem knives must we make an autopsy i asked yes and no i want to operate but not as you think let me tell you now but not a word to another i want to cut off her head and take out her heart <laughs> you a surgeon and so shocked you whom i have seen with no tremble of hand or heart do operations of life of death that make the rest shudder oh but i must not forget my dear friend john that you loved her and i have not forgotten it for it is i that shall operate and you must only help i would like to do it tonight but for arthur i must not he will be free after his father's funeral tomorrow and he will want to see her to see it and then when she is coffined ready for the next day you and i shall come when all sleep we shall do the operation and then replace all so that none know save we alone but why do it at all the girl is dead why mutilate her poor body without need and if there's no necessity for a post-mortem and nothing to gain by it no good to her to us to science to human knowledge why do it without such it is monstrous for an answer he put his hand on my shoulder 
and said with infinite tenderness, Friend John, I pity your poor bleeding heart, and I love you the more because it does so bleed. If I could, I would take on myself the burden that you do bear, but there are things that you know not, but that you shall know, and bless me for knowing, though they are not pleasant things. John, my child, you have been my friend now many years, and yet did you ever know me do anything without good cause? I may err, but I am a man, and I believe in all I do. Was it not for these causes that you sent me when the great trouble came? Yes. Were you not amazed, nay horrified, when I would not let Arthur kiss his love, though she was dying and snatched him away by all my strength? Yes. And yet you saw how she thanked me with her so beautiful dying eyes, a voice too so weak that she kisses my rough old hand and bless me. Yes, and did you not hear me swear, promise her, so that she closed her eyes, grateful? Yes. Well, I have good reason now for all I want to do. You have for many years, trust me. You have believed me in weeks past, when there be things so strange that you might well have doubt. Believe me yet a little, friend John, if you trust me not, then I must tell what I think, and that is not perhaps well. And if I work, as work I shall, no matter trust or no trust, without my friend trust in me, I work with a heavy heart and feel oh so lonely when I want all to help courage that may be. He paused a moment and went on solemnly. Friend John, there are strange and terrible days before us. Let us not be two, but one, so that we work to a good end. Will you not have faith in me? I took his hand and promised him. I held my door open as he went away, and I watched him go into his room and close the door. As I stood without moving, I saw one of the maids pass silently along the passage. She had her back towards me, so did not see me, and go into the room where Lucy lay. The sight touched me. Devotion is so rare, and we are so grateful to those who show it, unasked to those we love. Here was a poor girl putting aside the terrors which she naturally had of death, to go watch alone by the bier of a mistress whom she loved, so that the poor clay might not be lonely till laid to eternal rest. I must have slept long and soundly, for it was broad daylight when Van Helsing waked me by coming into my room. He came over to my bedside and said, You need not trouble about the knives, we shall not do it. Why not, I asked, for his solemnity of the night before had greatly impressed me. Because, he said sternly, it is too late, or too early, see. Here he held up the little golden crucifix. This was stolen in the night. How stolen, I asked in wonder, since you have it now, because I get it back from the worthless wretch who stole it, from the woman who robbed the dead and living. A punishment will surely come, but not through me. She knew not altogether what she did, and thus unknowing, she only stole. Now we must wait. He went away on the word, leaving me with a new mystery to think of, a new puzzle to grapple with. The forenoon was a dreary time, but at noon the solicitor came, Mr Marquand, of Holman Sons, Marquand and Lidderdale. He was very genial and very appreciative of what we had done, and took off our hand all the cares as to details. During lunch he told us that Mrs. Weston Ra had for some time expected sudden death from her heart, and had put her affairs in absolute order. He informed us that with the exception of a certain entailed property of Lucy's father's, which now in default of direct issue went back to a distant branch of the family, the whole estate real and personal, was left absolutely to Arthur Holmwood. When he had told us so much, he went on. Frankly, we did our best to prevent such a testamentary disposition, and pointed out certain contingencies that might leave her daughter either penniless or not so free as she should be to act regarding a matrimonial alliance. Indeed, we pressed the matter so far, we almost came to a collision 
or she asked us if we were or were not prepared to carry out her wishes. Of course, we then had no alternative but to accept. We were right in principle. In 99 times out of 100, we should have proved it by the logic of events. The accuracy of our judgment. Frankly, however, I must admit that in this case, any other form of disposition would have rendered impossible the carrying out of her wishes. But by her predeceasing her daughter, the latter would have come into possession of the property. And even if had she only survived her mother by five minutes, her property would, in case there were no will, and a will was a practical impossibility in such a case, have been treated at her decease as under intestacy, in which case Lord Goldmoning, though so dear a friend, would have had no claim in the world, and the inheritors being remote, would not be likely to abandon their just rights for sentimental reasons regarding an entire stranger. I assure you, my dear sirs, I am rejoiced at the result, perfectly rejoiced. He was a good fellow, but his rejoicing at the one little part in which he was officially interested of so great a tragedy was an object lesson in the limitations of sympathetic understanding. He did not remain long. He said he would look in later in the day and see Lord Godalming. His coming, however, had been a certain comfort to us, since it assured us that we should not have to dread hostile criticism as to any of our acts. Arthur was expected at five o'clock, so a little before that time we visited the death chamber. It was so in very truth, for now both mother and daughter lay in it. The undertaker, true to his craft, had made the best display he could of his goods, and there was a mortuary air about the place that lowered our spirits at one. Van Helsing ordered the former arrangement to be adhered to, explaining that as Lord Godalming was coming very soon, it would be less harrowing to his feelings to see all that was left of his fiancée quite alone. The undertaker seemed shocked at his own stupidity and exerted himself to restore things to the condition in which we left them the night before, so that when Arthur came, such shock to his feelings as we could avoid was saved. Poor fellow, he looked desperately sad and broken. Even his stalwart manhood seemed to have shrunk somewhat under the strain of his much-tried emotions. He had, I knew, been very genuinely and devotedly attached to his father, and to lose him at such a time was a bitter blow to him. With me he was as warm as ever, and Van Helsing he was sweetly courteous, but I could not help seeing there was some constraint with him. The Professor noticed it too, and mentioned me to bring him upstairs. I did so, and left him at the door of the room, as I felt he would like to be quite alone with her. But he took my arm and led me in, saying huskily, You loved her too, old fellow. She told me all about it, and there was no friend had a closer place in her heart than you. I don't know how to thank you for all you've done for her. I can't think yet. Here he suddenly broke down and threw his arms round my shoulders and laid his head on my breast, crying, Oh, Jack, Jack, what shall I do? The whole of life seems to have gone for me all at once. There's nothing in the wide world for me to live for. I comforted him as well as I could. In such cases, men do not need much expression. A grip on the hand, the tightening of an arm over the shoulder, a sob in unison are expressions of sympathy, dear to a man's heart. I stood still and silent till his sobs died away, and then I said softly to him, Come and look at her. Together we moved over to the bed and I lifted the lawn from her face. God, how beautiful she was. Every hour seemed to be enhancing her loveliness. It frightened and amazed me somewhat. And as for Arthur, he fell a trembling and finally was shaken with doubt as with an ague. And at last, after a long pause, he said to me in a faint whisper, Jack, is she really dead? I assured him sadly that it was so and went on to suggest for I felt that such a horrible doubt should not have life for a moment longer than I could help, 
that it often happened that after death faces become softened and even resolved to their youthful beauty, this was especially so when death had been preceded by any acute or prolonged suffering. It seemed to quite do away with any doubt, and after kneeling beside the couch for a while, and looking at her lovingly and long, he turned aside. I told him that that must be goodbye, as the coffin had to be prepared. So he went back and took her dead hand in his, and kissed it, and bent over and kissed her forehead. He came away, fondly looking back over his shoulder at her as he came. I left him in the drawing room and told Van Helsing that he had said good-bye, so the latter went to the kitchen to tell the undertaker's men to proceed with the preparations and to screw up the coffin. When he came out of the room again, I told him of Arthur's question, and he replied, I'm not surprised, just now I doubted for a moment myself. We all dined together, and I could see that poor Art was trying to make the best of things. Van Helsing had been silent all dinner time, but when we had lit our cigars, he said, Lord, but Arthur interrupted him. No, no, not that, for God's sake. Not yet, at any rate. Forgive me, sir. I did not mean to speak offensively. It's only because my loss is so recent. The professor answered very sweetly. I only used that name because I was in doubt. I must not call you Mr. I've grown to love you. Yes, my dear boy, to love you as Arthur. Arthur held out his hand and took the old man's warmly. Call me what you will, he said. I hope I may always have the title of a friend. And let me say that I am a loss for words to thank you for your goodness to my poor dear. He paused a moment and went on. I know that she understood your goodness even better than I do. And if I was rude or any way wanting at the time, you acted so. You remember, the Professor nodded. You must forgive me. He answered with a grave kindness. I know it was hard for you to quite trust me then, for to trust such violence needs to understand. And I take it that you do not, that you cannot trust me now, for you do not yet understand. And there may be more times when I shall want you to trust when you cannot, and may not, and must not yet understand. But the time will come when your trust shall be whole and complete in me. And when you shall understand as though the sunlight himself shone through you, then shall you bless me from first to last for your own sake and for the sake of others and for her dear sake to whom I swore to protect. And indeed, indeed, sir, said Arthur warmly, I shall in all ways trust you. I know and believe you have a very noble heart. You are Jack's friend and you were hers. You shall do what you like. The professor cleared his throat a couple of times, as though to speak, and finally said, May I ask you something now? Certainly. You know that Mrs. Westenra left you all her property. No, poor dear, I never thought of it. As it's all yours, and you have the right to deal with it as you will, I want you to give me permission to read all Miss Lucy's papers and letters. Believe me, it is no idle curiosity. I have a motive of which be sure she would have approved. I have them all here. I took them before we knew that all was yours, so that no strange hand might touch them, and no strange eye look through the words into her soul. I shall keep them, if I may, even though you may not see them yet, but I shall keep them safe. No word shall be lost, and in the good time I shall give them back to you. It's not a hard thing, I ask. But you'll do it, will you not, for Lucy's sake? Arthur spoke out heartily like his old self. Dr. Van Helsing, you may do what you will. I feel that in saying this, I'm doing what my dear one would have approved. I shall not trouble you with questions till the time comes. The old professor stood up as he said solemnly, And you are right, there will be pain for us all. But it will not be all pain, nor will this pain be the last. We, and you too, you most of all, my dear boy, will have to pass through the bitter water before we reach the sweet. But we must be brave of heart and unselfish, and do our duty and all will be well. 
I slept on the sofa in Arthur's room that night, and Helsing did not go to bed at all. He went to and fro as if patrolling the house, and was never out of sight of the room where Lucy lay in her coffin, strewn with the wild garlic flowers, which sent through the odour of lily and rose a heavy, overpowering smell into the night. Mina Harker's Journal, 22nd of September In the train to Exeter, Jonathan sleeping. It seems only yesterday that the last entry was made, and yet how much between then in Whitby and all the world before me, Jonathan away and no news of him, and now married to Jonathan, Jonathan a solicitor, a partner, rich master of his business, Mr Hawkins dead and buried, and Jonathan with another attack that may harm him. And some day he may ask me about it. Down it all goes. I'm rusty in my shorthand. See what unexpected prosperity does for us, so it may be as well to freshen it up again with an exercise. Anyhow, the service is very simple and very solemn. There are only ourselves and the servants there. One or two old friends of his from Exeter, his London agent, and a gentleman representing Sir John Paxton, President of the Incorporated Law Society. Jonathan and I stood hand in hand, and we felt that our best and dearest friend was gone from us. We came back to town quietly, taking a bus to Hyde Park Corner. Jonathan thought it would interest me to go into the row for a while, so we sat down. But there were very few people there, and it was a sad-looking and desolate place, to see so many empty chairs. It made us think of the empty chair at home. So we got up and walked down Piccadilly. Jonathan was holding me by the arm the way he used to in the old days before I went to school. I felt it very improper, for you can't go for some years teaching etiquette and decorum to other girls without the pedantry of it biting into yourself a bit. But it was Jonathan, and he was my husband and we didn't know anybody who saw us, and we didn't care if they did. So on we walked. I was looking at a very beautiful girl in a big cartwheel hat, sitting in a Victoria outside Giuliano's, and I felt Jonathan clutch my arm so tight that he hurt me, and he said under his breath, My God! I'm always anxious about Jonathan. I fear that some nervous fit may upset him again. So I turned to him quickly and asked him what it was that disturbed him. He was very pale, and his eyes seemed bulging out as half in terror, half in amazement. He gazed at a tall, thin man with a beaky nose and a black moustache and a pointed beard. He was also observing the pretty girl. He was looking at her so hard that he did not see either of us, so I had a good view of him. His face was not a good face. It was hard, cruel and sensual, and his big white teeth that looked like all the whiter with his lips were so red, were pointed like an animal's. Jonathan kept staring at him, till I was afraid he would notice. I feared he might take ill. He looked so fierce and nasty. I asked Jonathan why he was disturbed, and he answered, evidently thinking that I knew as much about it as he did. Did you, did you see who it is? No, dear, I said. I don't know him. Who is it? His answer seemed to shock and thrill me for it was said as if he did not know that it was to me, Mina, to whom he was speaking. It is the man himself. Poor dear was evidently terrified at something, very greatly terrified. I do believe that if he had not had me to lean on and to support him, he would have sunk down. He kept staring. A man came out of the shop with a small parcel, gave it to the lady who then drove off. The dark man kept his eyes fixed on her, and when the carriage moved up Piccadilly, he followed in the same direction, and hailed a hansom. John kept looking after him, and said as if to himself, I believe it is the Count, but he has grown young. My God, if this be so, oh my God, my God, if I only knew, if I only knew. He was distressing himself so much that I feared to keep his mind on the subject by asking him any questions. So I remained silent. I drew him away quietly, and he, holding my arm, came easily. We walked a little further, and then went in and sat for a while in the green park. 
It was a hot day for autumn, and there was a comfortable seat in a shady place. After a few minutes staring at nothing, Jonathan's eyes closed and he went quietly into a sleep. With his head on my shoulder, I thought it was the best thing for him, so it did not disturb him. In about twenty minutes, he woke up and said to me quite cheerfully, Hi, oh, Amina, I've been asleep. Oh, do forgive me for being so rude. Come and we'll have a cup of tea somewhere. He'd evidently forgotten all about the dark stranger, as if in his illness had forgotten all that this episode had reminded him of. I don't like this lapsing into forgetfulness. It may make or continue some injury to the brain. I must not ask him, for I fear I should do more harm than good. But I must somehow learn the facts of his journey abroad. The time has come, I fear, when I must open that parcel and know what is written. Oh, Jonathan, you will, I know, forgive me if I do wrong. But it is for your own dear sake. Later. A sad homecoming in every way. The house empty and the dear soul who was so good to us. Jonathan was still pale and dizzy under a slight relapse of his malady. And now a telegram from Van Helsing, whoever he may be. You will be grieved to hear that Mrs. Westenra died five days ago and that Lucy died the day before yesterday. They were both buried today. Oh, what a wealth of sorrow in a few words. Poor Mrs. Westenra, poor Lucy, gone, never to return to us, and poor Arthur to have lost such sweetness out of his life. God help us all to bear our troubles. Dr. Seward's Diary, 22nd of September. It's all over. Arthur has gone back to the ring, has taken Quincy Morris with him. What a fine fellow is Quincy. I believe in my heart of hearts that he suffered as much about Lucy's death as any of But he bore himself, though, like a moral Viking. If America can go on breeding men like that, she will be a power in the world indeed. Van Helsing is lying down, having a rest proprietary to his journey. He goes over to Amsterdam tonight, but he says he returns tomorrow night, and that he only wants to make some arrangements which can only be made personally. He's to stop with me then, if he can, he says. He has work to do in London, which may take him some time. Poor old fellow, I fear that even the strain of the past week has broken down even his iron strength. All the time of the burial he was, I could see, putting some terrible restraint on himself. When it was all over, and we were standing beside Arthur, who, poor fellow, was speaking of his part in the operation where his blood had been transfused to his Lucy veins. I could see Van Helsing's face grow white and purple by turns. Arthur was saying that he felt since then as if they two had been really married, and that she was his wife in the sight of God. None of us said a word of the other operations, and none of us ever shall. Arthur and Quincy went away together to the station, and Van Helsing and I came on here. The moment we were alone in the carriage, he gave way to a regular fit of hysterics. He has denied to me since that it was hysterics, and insisted it was only his sense of humour asserting itself under very terrible conditions. He laughed till he cried. I had to draw down the blinds lest anyone should see us and misjudge. And then he cried till he laughed again and laughed and cried together, just as a woman does. I tried to be stern with him, as one is to a woman under the circumstances, but it had no effect. Men and women are so different in manifestations of nervous strength or weakness. Then, when his face grew grave and stern again, I asked him why his mirth, and why at such a time. His reply was in a way characteristic of it, for it was logical, and forceful, and mysterious. He said, Ah, oh, you don't comprehend, friend John. Do not think that I am not sad, though I laugh. See, I have cried even when the laugh did choke me. But no more think I am all sorry when I cry, for the laugh he come just the same. Keep it always with you, that laughter, who knock at your door and say, May I come in? It is not the true laughter. No, he is a king, and he come when and how he like. He asks no person. He choose no time of suitability. He say, I am here, 
behold an example. I grieve my heart out for that so sweet young girl. I give my blood for her, though I am old and worn. I give my time, my skill, my sleep. I let my other suffer as want, so that she may have all. And yet I can laugh at her very grave. Laugh when the clay from the spade of the sexton drop upon her coffin and say thud, thud to my heart till it sent back the blood from my cheek. My heart bleed for that poor boy, that dear boy, so of the age of mine own boy, had I seen so blessed that he live, and with his hair and eyes the same. There you know now why I love him so. And yet when he say things that touch my husband's heart to the quick, and make my father heart yearn to him as to no other man, not even to you, friend John, for we are more level in experiences than father and son. Not even at such moment, King laughed, he come to me and shout, bellow in my ear, here I am, here I am, till the blood come dance back and bring some of the sunshine that he carried with him to my cheek. Ah, oh, friend John, it is a strange world and a sad world, a world full of miseries and woes and troubles. And yet when King Laugh come, he make them all chance to the tune he play. Bleeding hearts and dry bones of the churchyard, and tears that burn as they fall, all dance together to the music that he make with that smileless mouth of him. And believe me, friend John, that he is good to come and kind. Ah, uh, we men and women are like ropes, drawn tight with strain, that pull us in different ways. Then tears come, and like the rain on the ropes, they brace us up, until perhaps the strain become too great and we break. But King Laugh, he come again like the sunshine. Then he ease off the strain again, and we bear to go on with our labour, what it may be. I did not like to wound him by pretending not to see his idea. But as I did not yet understand the cause of his laughter, I asked him. As he answered me, his face grew stern, and he said in a quite different tone, oh, I was a grim iron out of it all. This so lovely lady garlanded with flowers that looked so fair as life, till by one hand we wondered if she were truly dead. She laid in that so fine and marble house, in that lonely churchyard, where rest so many of her kin, laid there with the mother who loved her and whom she loved and that sacred bell going toll 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 so sad and slow and those holy men with their white garments of the angel pretending to read books and yet all the time their eyes never on the page and all of us with a bowed head and all for what she is dead so is it not well for the life of me professor i said I don't, can't see anything to laugh about and all that. Well, your explanation makes it even a harder puzzle than before. Even if the burial service was comic, what about poor Art and his trouble? Why, his heart was simply breaking. Just so, said he not that transfusion of his blood into her brains had made her truly his bride. Yes, and it was a sweet and comforting idea for him. Quite so, but there was a difficulty, friend John. If so, that when, what about the others? Oh, <laughs> so this with sweet maid is a polyanderist, and me with my poor wife dead to me, but alive by church's law, as though no wits were all gone. Even I, who am a faithful husband, to this now no wife, I'm a bigamist. I don't see where the joke comes from in there either, I said, and I did not feel particularly pleased with him for saying such things. He laid his hand upon my arm and said, Friend John, forgive me if I pain. I showed not my feelings to others when it would wound, but only to you, my old friend, whom I can trust. If you could have looked into my very heart then, when I want to laugh, if you could have done so when the laugh arrived, if you could do so now, when King Laugh have packed up his crown, and all that is to him, for he go far, far away from me long, and for a long, long time. Maybe you would perhaps pity me the most of all. I was touched by the tenderness of his tone and asked why. Because I know. And now we are all scattered. And for many a long day, loneliness will sit over our roofs with brooding wings. Lucy lies in the tomb of her kin, a lordly death house in a lonely churchyard, far away from teeming London, 
where the air is fresh and the sun rises over Hampstead Hill, and where wildflowers grow of their own accord. So I can finish this diary, and God only knows if I shall ever begin another. If I do, or even if I open this again, it will be to deal with different people and different themes. For here, at the end where the romance of my life is told, ere I go back to take up the thread of my life work, I say sadly and without hope, fierce. The Westminster Gazette, 25th of September, Hampstead Mystery. The neighbourhood of Hampstead is just at present exercised with a series of events which seem to run on lines parallel to those of what was known to the writers of headlines The Kensington Horror, or The Stabbing Woman, or The Woman in Black. During the past two or three days, several cases have occurred of young children straying from home or neglecting to return from their playing on the heath. In all these cases, the children were too young to give any properly intelligible account of themselves. Consensus in their excuses has been that they'd been with a bluefer lady. It's always been late in the evening they had been missing. On two occasions, the children have not been found until early the following morning. It is generally supposed in the neighbourhood, unless the first child miss gave his reason for being away, that, that a bluefer lady had asked him to come for a walk. The others had picked up the phrase and used it as occasion served. This is the more natural as the favourite game of the little ones at present is luring each other away by wiles. A correspondent writes to us to see some of the tiny tots pretending to be the bluefer lady is supremely funny. Some of our characterists might, he says, take a lesson in the irony of grotesque by comparing the reality and the picture. It is only in accordance with the general principles of human nature that the bluefer lady should be the popular role of these alfresco performances. Our correspondent naively says that even Ellen Terry could not be so winningly attractive as some of these grubby-faced little children pretend and even imagine themselves to be. There is, however, possibly a serious side to the question. For some of the children, indeed all who have been missed that night, have been slightly torn or wounded in the throat. The wounds seem to be as might be made by a rat or a small dog. And although of not much importance, individually, would tend to show that whatever animal inflicts them has a system or method of its own. Police of the division have been instructed to a sharp lookout for straying children, especially when very young, in and around Hampstead Heath, and for any stray dog which may be about. The Westminster Gazette, 25th of September, extra special. The Hampstead Horror, another child injured. The Bluefer Lady. We've just received intelligence that another child missed last night was only discovered late in the morning under a furze bush at the Shooter's Hill side of Hampstead Heath, which is perhaps less frequented than the other parts. It has been the same tiny wound in the throat as has been noticed in other cases. It was terribly weak and looked quite emaciated. It too, when partially restored, had the common story to tell of being lured away by the Bluefer Lady. End of chapter 13Chapter 14 of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14 Mina Harker's Journal. 23rd of September. Jonathan is better after a bad night. I am so glad that he has plenty of work to do, for well, that keeps his mind off the terrible things, and oh, I am rejoiced that he is not now weighed down with the responsibility of his new position. I knew he would be true to himself, and now how proud I am to see my Jonathan rising to the height of his advancement, and keeping pace in all ways with the duties that come upon him. He will be away all day till late, for he said he could not lunch at home. My household work is done, so I shall take this foreign journal 
and lock myself in my room and read it. 24th of September. I hadn't the heart to write last night. That terrible record of Jonathan's upset me so. Poor dear, how he must have suffered, whether it be true or only imagination. I wonder if there's any truth in it at all. Did he get his brain fever and then write it all those terrible things? Or had he some cause for it all? I suppose I shall never know, for I dare not open the subject to him. And yet that man we saw yesterday, he seemed quite certain of him. Poor fellow, I suppose it was the funeral upset him and sent his mind back on some train of thought. He believes it all himself. I remember how on our wedding day he said, unless some solemn duty come upon me to go back to the bitter hours, asleep or awake, mad or sane, there seems to be through all some thread of continuity that fearful count was coming to London. If it should be, and he came to London with his teeming millions, there may be a solemn duty, and if it come, we must not shrink from it. I shall be prepared. I shall get my typewriter this very hour and begin transcribing. Then we shall be ready for other eyes if required. And if it be wanted, then perhaps if I am ready, poor Jonathan may not be upset. Or I can speak for him and never let him be troubled or worried with it all. If ever Jonathan quite gets over the nervousness, he may want to tell me of it all. And I can ask him questions and find out things and see how I may comfort him. Letter Van Helsing to Mrs. Harker, 24th of September. Confidence. Dear Madam, I pray you to pardon my writing in that I am so far a friend as that I sent you the sad news of Miss Lucy Westenra's death. By the kindness of Lord Godalming, I am empowered to read her letters and papers, for I am deeply concerned about certain matters vitally important. In them I find some letters from you, which show how great friends you were, and how you love her. Oh, Madam Mina, by that love I implore you to help me. It is for others' good that I ask. To redress a great wrong, and to lift much and terrible troubles, that may be more great than you can know. May it be that I see you, you can trust me, I am friend of Dr. John Seward, and of Lord Godalming, that was Arthur of Miss Lucy. I must keep it private for the present from all. I should come to Exeter to see you at once if you tell me. I am privileged to come. And where and when I implore your pardon, madam, I have read your letters to poor Lucy, and know how good you are, and how your husband suffer. So I pray again, if it may be, enlighten him not, lest it may harm. Again your pardon and forgive me, Van Helsing. Telegram, Mrs. Harker to Van Helsing, 25th of September. Come today by quarter past ten train if you can catch it. Can see you at any time you call. Wilhelmina Harker. Mina Harker's Journal, 25th of September. I cannot help feeling terribly excited as the time draws near for the visit of Dr. Van Helsing. For somehow I expect that it will throw some light upon Jonathan's sad experience. And as he attended poor dear Lucy in her last illness, he can tell me all about her. That is the reason for his coming. It is concerning Lucy and her sleepwalking, and not about Jonathan, that I shall never know the real truth. How silly I am. That awful journal gets hold of my imagination, and tinges everything with something of its own colour. Of course it's about Lucy. That habit came back to the poor dear, and that awful night on the cliff must have made her ill. I'd almost forgotten in my own affairs how ill she was afterwards. She must have told him of her sleepwalking adventure on the cliff, and that I knew all about it, and now he wants me to tell him what she knows, so that he may understand. I hope I did right in not saying anything of it to Mrs. Westenra. I should never forgive myself if any act of mine, were it even a negative one, brought harm on poor dear Lucy. I hope so too. Dr. Van Helsing will not blame me. I have had so much trouble and anxiety of late that I feel I cannot bear more at present. 
I suppose the cry does us all good at times. Clears the air as the other rain does. Perhaps it was just reading the journal yesterday that upset me. And then Jonathan went away this morning. To stay away from me a whole day and night. For the first time we have been parted since our marriage. I hope the dear fellow will take care of himself. That nothing will occur to upset him. It's two o'clock and the doctor will be here soon now. I shall say nothing of Jonathan's journal unless he asks me. I am so glad I have a type written out of my own journal, so that in case he asks about Lucy, I can hand it to him. It will save much questioning. Later. He has come and gone. Well, what a strange meeting, and how it all makes my head whirl round. I feel like one in a dream. Can it all be possible, or even part of it? If I had not read Jonathan's journal first, I should never have accepted even the possibility. Poor, poor dear Jonathan, how he must have suffered. Please the good God, all this may not upset him again. I shall try and save him from it, but it may be even a consolation and help to him. Terrible though it be, and awful in its consequences. To know for certain that his eyes and ears and brain did not deceive him, and that it is all true. It may be that it is the doubt which haunts him, that when the doubt is removed, no matter which, waking or dreaming, may prove the truth. He will be more satisfied and better able to bear the shock. Dr. Van Helsing must be a good man, as well as a clever one, if he is Arthur's friend and Dr. Seward's, and they say brought him all the way from Holland to look after Lucy. I feel from having seen him that he is good and kind and of a noble nature. When he comes tomorrow I shall ask him about Jonathan, and then please God all this sorrow and anxiety may lead to a good end. I used to think I would like to practice interviewing Jonathan's friend on the Exeter News and told him that memory was everything in such work that you must be able to put down exactly almost every word spoken, even if you had to refine some of it afterwards. Here was a rare interview. I shall try to record it verbatim. It was half past two o'clock when the knock came. I took my courage, Abdulmain, and waited. In a few minutes, Mary opened the door and announced Dr Van Helsing. I rose and bowed, and he came towards me. A man of medium weight, a strong build, with his shoulders set back over a broad, deep chest, and a neck well balanced on the trunk, as the head is on the neck. The poise of the head strikes one at once as indicative of thought and power. The head is noble, well-sized, broad and large behind the ears. The face clean-shaven, shows a hard, square chin, a large, resolute, mobile mouth, a good-sized nose, rather straight but with quick, sensitive nostrils that seem to broaden as the big bushy brows came down and the mouth tightens. The forehead is broad and fine, rising at first almost straight and then sloping back above two humps or ridges wide apart. Such a forehead that the reddish hair cannot possibly tumble over it, but falls naturally back into the sides. Big dark blue eyes are set widely apart and are quick and tender or stern with the man's moods. He said to me, Mrs Harker, is it not? I bowed assent. That was Miss Mina Murray. Again I assented. It is Mina Murray that I came to see that was a friend of that poor dear child Lucy Westenra. Madame Mina, it is on account of the dead I come. Sir, I said, you can have no better claim on me than that you were a friend and helper of Lucy Westenra, and held out my hand. He took it and said tenderly, Oh, Madam Mina, I knew that the friend of that poor little girl must be good, but I had yet to learn. He finished his speech with a courtly bow. I asked him what it was that he wanted to see me about. So he at once began. I have read your letters to Miss Lucy. Forgive me, but I had to begin to inquire somewhere. And there was none to ask. I know that you were with her at Whitby. She sometimes kept a diary. You need not look surprised, Madam Mina. It was begun after you had left and was an imitation of you. 
and in that diary she traces by inference certain things to a sleepwalking in which she puts down that you saved her. In great perplexity I come to you and ask you, out of your so much kindness, to tell me all of that you can remember. I can tell you, I think, Dr. Van Housing, all about it. Ah, then, you have a good memory for facts, for details. It is not always so with young ladies. No, Doctor, but I wrote it all down at the time. I can show it to you if you like. Oh, Madam Mina, I will be grateful you will do me much favour. I could not resist the temptation of mystifying him a bit. I suppose it is some of the taste of the original apple that still remains in our mouths. So I handed him the shorthand diary. He took it with a graceful bow and said, May I read it? If you wish, I answered as demurely as I could. He opened it, and for an instant his face fell. Then he stood up and bowed. Oh, you so clever woman, he said. I knew long that Mr. Jonathan was a man of much thankfulness, but I see his wife have all the good things, and will you not so much honour me and so help me as to read it for me? Alas, I know not the shorthand. By this time my little joke was over, and I was almost ashamed, so I took the typewritten copy from my work basket and handed it to him. Forgive me, I said, I could not help it but I had been thinking that it was of dear Lucy that you wished to ask, and you might not have time to wait, not on my account, but because I know your time must be precious. I have written it out on the typewriter for you. He took it, and his eyes glistened. You are so good, he said, and may I read it now? I may want to ask you some things when I have read. By all means, I said, read it over whilst I order lunch, and then you can ask me questions whilst we eat. He bowed and settled himself on a chair with his back to the light, and became absorbed in the papers, whilst I went to see after lunch chiefly in order to see that he might not be disturbed. When I came back, I found him walking hurriedly up and down the room, his face all ablaze with excitement. He rushed up to me and took me by both hands. Oh, Madam Mina, he said, how can I say what I owe to you? This paper is a sunshine. It opens the gate to me. I am dazed, I am dazzled, with so much light, and yet clouds roll in behind the light every time. But that you do not, cannot comprehend. But I am grateful to you, you so clever woman. Madame, he said this very solemnly, if ever Abraham Van Helsing can do anything for you or yours, I trust you will let me know. It will be a pleasure and delight if I may serve you as a friend. As a friend, but all I have ever learned, all I can ever do, shall be for you and those you love. There are darknesses in life, and there are lights. You are one of the lights. You will have a happy life and a good life, and your husband will be blessed in you. But, Doctor, you praise me too much. You do not know me. Not know you. I, who am old and who have studied all my life, men and women, I, who have made my speciality the brain and all that belongs to him and all that follows from him, and I have read your diary that you have so goodly written for me, and which breathes out true in every line. I, who have read your so sweet letter to poor Lucy of your marriage and your trust, and not know you, oh, Madam Mina, good woman, tell all their lives, and by day and by hour and by minute, such things that angels can read, and we men who wish to know having us something of angels' eyes. Your husband is noble nature. You are noble too, for you trust. And trust cannot be where there is mean nature. And your husband, tell me of him. Is he quite well? Is all that fever gone? Is he strong and hearty? I saw here an opening to ask him about Jonathan. So I said, he is almost recovered, but he's been greatly upset by Mr Hawkins' death. He interrupted. Oh, yes, I know, I know. I've read your last two letters. I went on. I suppose it's upsetting, for when we were in town on Thursday, he had a sort of a shock. A shock? After a brain fever? So soon? That was not good. What kind of shock was it? He thought he saw someone who recalled something terrible, something which led to his brain fever. And here the whole thing seemed to overwhelm me in such a rush. The pity for Jonathan 
the horror which he had experienced, and the fear that had been brooding over me ever since. It all came in a tumult. I suppose I was hysterical. I threw myself on my knees, held up my hands to him, and implored him to make my husband well again. He took my hands and raised me up, and made me sit on the sofa, and sat by me. He held my hand in his, and he said to me, with all oh, such infinite sweetness, my life is a barren and lonely one, and so full of work that I have not yet had much time for friendships. But since I have been summoned here by my friend John Seward, I have known so many good people, and seen such nobility that I feel more than ever, and it has grown with my advancing years, the loneliness of my life. Believe me then that I come here full of respect for you, and you have given me hope. Hope not in what I am seeking of, but that there are good women still left to make life happy. Good women whose lives and whose truths may make a good lesson for the children that are to be. I am glad, glad that I may be here of some use to you. If your husband suffer, he suffer within the range of my study and experience. I promise you that I will gladly do all for him that I can. All to make his life strong and manly and your life a happy one. Now you must eat. You are overwrought and perhaps over-anxious. Husband Jonathan would not like to see you so pale. What he liked not, where he loved, is not to his good. Therefore, for his sake, you must eat and smile. You have told me all about Lucy, and so now we shall not speak of it, lest it distress. I shall stay in Exeter tonight, for I want to think much over what you have told me, and when I have thought, I will ask you questions. And then if I may, and then too you will tell me of your husband Jonathan's trouble, as far as you can, but not yet. You must eat now, afterwards you shall tell me. After lunch, when we went back into the drawing room, he said to me, and now tell me about him. When it came to speaking to this great learned man, I began to fear that he would think me a weak fool and Jonathan a madman. That journal also strange in our head, and I hesitated to go on. But he was so sweet and kind, and he had promised to help, and I trusted him. So I said, Dr. Van Helsing, what I have to tell you is so queer that you must not laugh at me or at my husband. I have been since yesterday in a sort of fever of doubt. You must be kind to me, and not think me foolish, that I have even half believed some very strange things. He reassured me by his manner as well as his words when he said, Oh, my dear, if you only knew how strange is the matter regarding which I am here. It is you who would laugh. I have learned not to think little of anyone's belief, no matter how strange it be. I have tried to keep an open mind, and it is not the ordinary things of life that could close it, but the strange things, the extraordinary things, the things that make one doubt if they be mad or sane. Thank you, thank you a thousand times. You have taken a weight off my mind. If you will let me, I shall give you a paper to read. It's long, but I have typewritten it out. It will tell you my trouble and Jonathan's. It is the copy of his journal when abroad and all that happened. I dare not say anything of it. You will read it for yourself and judge. And then when I see you, perhaps you will be very kind and tell me what you think. I promise, he said, as I gave him the papers. I shall in the morning, as soon as I can, come to see you and your husband, if I may. Jonathan will be here at half past eleven, and you must come to lunch with us and see him then. You can catch the quick 3.34 train, which will leave you at Paddington before eight. He was surprised at my knowledge of the trains offhand, but he does not know that I have made up my mind that all the trains to and from Exeter, so that I may help Jonathan in case he's in a hurry. So he took the papers with him, and went away, and I sat here thinking, thinking I don't know what. Letter by hand, Van Helsing, to Mrs. Harker, 25th of September, 6 o'clock. Dear Madam Mina, I have read your husband's so wonderful diary. You may sleep without doubt, strange and terrible as it is, it is true. I will pledge my life on it. It may be worse for others, but for him and you there is no dread. He is a noble fellow, and let me tell you from experience of men that one would do as he did going down that wall to that room 
I and going in a second time is not one to be injured in permanence by a shock. His brain and his heart are all right. This I swear before I have even seen him. So be at rest. I shall have much to ask him of other things. I am blessed that today I came to see you. For I have learned all at once so much that again I am dazzled. Dazzled more than ever. And I must think. Yours the most faithful Abraham Van Helsing. Letter Mrs. Harker to Van Helsing. 25th of September. 6.30pm. My dear Dr. Van Helsing, a thousand thanks for your kind letter, which has taken a great weight off my mind. And yet, if it be true, what terrible things there are in the world, and what an awful thing if that man, that monster, be really in London. I fear to think, I have this moment whilst writing, had a wire from Jonathan, saying that he leaves by the 6.25 tonight from Launceston, and will be here at 10.18 so that I shall have no fear tonight. Will you therefore, instead of lunching with us, please come to breakfast at eight o'clock, if this be not too early for you. You can get away if you are in a hurry by the 10.30 train, which will bring you to Paddington by 2.35. Do not answer this, as I shall take it, and if I do not hear, you will come to breakfast. Believe me, your faithful and grateful friend, Mina Harker. Jonathan Harker's Journal, 16th of September I thought never to write in this diary again, but the time has come. When I got home last night, Mina had supper ready, and when we had supped she told me of Van Helsing's visit, and of her having given him the two diaries copied out, and of how anxious she has been about me. She showed me in the doctor's letter all that I wrote down was true. It seems to have made a new man of me. It was the doubt as to the reality of the whole thing that knocked me over. I felt impotent and in the dark, and distrustful. And now that I know I am not afraid, even of the Count, he has succeeded after all then in his design in getting to London. And it was he I saw. He's gotten younger. And how? Van Helsing is the man to unmask him and hunt him out if he is anything like what Mina says. We sat late and talked it all over. Mina is dressing, and I shall call at the hotel in a few minutes and bring him over. He was, I think, surprised to see me when I came into the rooms where he was, and introduced myself. He took me by the shoulder and turned my face round into the light, and said after a sharp scrutiny, But Madame Mina told me that you were ill, that you had had a shock. It was so funny to hear my wife called Madame Mina by this kindly, strong-faced old man. I smiled and said, I was ill. I've had a shock, but you have cured me already. And how? By your letter to Mina last night. I was in doubt, and then everything took a hue of unreality. I did not know what to trust, even the evidence of my own senses. Not knowing what to trust, I did not know what to do and so had only to keep on working in what had hitherto had been the groove of my life. The groove ceased to avail me, and I mistrusted myself. Doctor, you don't know what it is to doubt everything, even yourself. No, you don't. You couldn't with eyebrows like yours. He seemed pleased and laughed as he said, So, you're a physiognomist. I learn more here with each hour, and with so much pleasure coming to you to breakfast, and, oh, sir, you will pardon praise from an old man, but you are blessed in your wife. I would listen to him go on praising Mina for a day, so I simply nodded and stood silent. She is one of God's women, fashioned by his own hand to show us men and other women that there is a heaven where we can enter, and that its light can be here on earth, so true, so sweet, so noble, so little an egoist. And let me tell you, as much in this age, so sceptical and selfish, and you, sir, I have read all the letters to your poor Miss Lucy, and some of them speak of you, for I know you since some days from the knowing of others. But I have seen your true self since last night, and you will give me your hand, will you not, and let us be friends for all our lives. We shook hands, 
and he was so earnest and so kind that it made me quite choky. And now, he said, may I ask you for some more help? I have a great task to do, and at the beginning it is to know. You can help me here. Can you tell me what went before your going to Transylvania? Later on I may ask more help, and of a different kind. This will do. Look here, sir, I said. That's what you have to do, concern the Count. It does, he said solemnly. And I am with you heart and soul. As you go by the 10.30 train, you will not have time to read them, but I shall get the bundle of papers. You can take them with you and read them in the train. After breakfast, I saw him to the station. When we were parting, he said, Perhaps you will come to town if I send to you, and take Madame Mina too. We shall both come when you will, I said. I had got him in the morning papers, and the London papers of the previous night, and while we were talking at the carriage window, waiting for the train to start, he was turning them over. His eyes suddenly seemed to catch something in one of them. The Westminster Gazette. I knew it by the colour, and he grew quite white. Then he read something intently, groaning to himself. My God, my God, so soon, so soon. I do not think he remembered me at the moment. Just then the whistle blew and the train moved off. This recalled him to himself as he leaned out of the window and waved his hand, calling out, Love to Madame Mina. I shall write so soon as I ever can. Dr. Seward's Diary 26 September Truly there is no such thing as finality. Not a week since I had said finish, and yet here I am with the same record. Until this afternoon I had no cause to think of what is done. Renfield had become all too intent, the same as he ever was. He was already well ahead with his fly business, and had just started in the spider line also. So he had not been of any trouble to me. I had a letter from Arthur written on Sunday, and from it I gather he is bearing up wonderfully. Well, Quincy Morris is with him, and that is much of a help, for he himself is a bubbling well of good spirits. Quincy wrote me a line too, and from him I hear that Arthur is beginning to recover something of his old buoyancy. So as to them all, my mind is at rest. And as for myself, I was settling down to my work with an enthusiasm which I used to have for it, so that I might fairly have said that the wound which poor Lucy left on me was becoming cauterised. Everything is, however, now reopened. And what is to be the end? God only knows. I have an idea that Van Helsing thinks he knows too, but he will only let out enough at a time to wet curiosity. He went to Exeter yesterday and stayed there all night. Today he came back and almost bounded into the room at about half past five o'clock and thrust last night's Westminster Gazette into my hand. What do you think of that? he asked as he stood back and folded his arms. I looked over the paper, for I really did not know what he meant, but he took it from me and pointed to a paragraph about children being decoyed away at Hampstead. It did not convey much to me until I reached a passage where it described small punctured wounds on their throats. An idea struck me and I looked up. Well, he said, it's like poor Lucy's, and what do you make of it? Simply that there is some cause in common, whatever it was that injured her, has injured them. I did not quite understand his answer. That is true indirectly, but not directly. How do you mean, Professor, I asked. I was a little inclined to take his seriousness lightly, for after all, four days of rest and freedom from burning, harrowing anxiety does not help restore one's spirits. But when I saw his face, it sobered me. Never, even in the midst of our despair about poor Lucy, had he looked more stern. Tell me, he said, I can hazard no opinion. I do not know what to think, and I have no data on which to found a conjecture. Do you mean to tell me, friend John, that you have no suspicion as to what poor Lucy died of? Not after all the hints given, not only by events, but by me. Of nervous prostration, following on a great loss or waste of blood. And how the blood was lost or waste? I shook my head. He stepped over and sat down beside me and went on. You're a clever man, friend John. You reason well and your wit is bold. But you're too prejudiced. 
You do not let your eyes see nor your ears hear, and that which is outside your daily life is not of account to you. You do not think there are things which you cannot understand, and yet which are, that some people see things that others cannot. But there are things old and new which must not be contemplated by men's eyes, because they know, or think they know, some things which other men have told them. Ah, it is a fault of our science that wants to explain it all, and it explain it not, and then it says there is nothing to explain. But yet we see around us every day the growth of new beliefs, which think themselves new, and which are yet but the old, which pretend to be young, like the fine ladies at the opera. I suppose now you do not believe in corporeal transference, no, nor in materialization, no, nor in astral bodies, no, nor in the reading of thought, no, nor in hypnotism. Yes, I said, Charcot has proved that pretty well. He smiled as you went on. Then you are satisfied as to it. Yes, and of course you understand how it acts and how it can follow the mind of the great Charcot. Alas, that he is no more into the very soul of the patient that he influenced, no? Then, friend John, I am to take it that you simply accept the fact and are satisfied to let it, from premise to conclusion, be a blank. No, then tell me, for I am a student of the brain, how you accept the hypnotism and reject the thought reading. Let me tell you, my friend, there are things done today in electrical science which would have been deemed unholy by the very men who discovered electricity, who would themselves, not long before, have been burnt as wizards. There are always mysteries in life. Why was it that Methuselah lived 900 years, and old Parr 169? Yet that poor Lucy, with four men's blood in her poor veins, could not live even one day. For had she lived one more day, we could have saved her. You know all the mystery of life and death, do you know the altogether of comparative anatomy that can say wherefore the qualities of brutes are in some men and not in others? Can you tell me why, when other spiders die, small and soon, that one great spider lived for centuries in the tower of the old Spanish church and grew and grew until descending he could drink the oil of the church lamps? Can you tell me why that in the pampas, I elsewhere, there are bats that come at night and open the veins of cattle and horses and suck dry their veins. How in some islands of the western seas there are bats which hang on the trees all day and those who have seen describe as like giant nuts or pods and that when the sailors sleep on the deck because it's that hot flit down on them and then in the morning are found dead men white as even Miss Lucy was. Good God, Professor, I said starting up. Do you mean to tell me that Lucy was bitten by such a bat, and that such a thing is here in London in the 19th century. He waved his hands for silence and went on. Can you tell me why the tortoise lives more long than generations of men, why the elephant goes on and on until he has seen dynasties, and why the parrot never die only a bite of cat or dog or other complaint? Can you tell me why men believe in ages and places that there are some few who live on always, if they be permit, and there are men and women who cannot die. We all know because science has vouched for the fact that there have been toads shut up in rocks for thousands of years, shut in one so small hole that only one hold him since the youth of the world. Can you tell me how the Indian fakir can make himself die and have been buried and his grave sealed and corn sown on it, and the corn reaped and be cut and sown and reaped and cut again? and let men come and take away the unbroken seal, and that there lie the Indian fakir, not dead, but rise up and walk amongst them as before. I was getting bewildered. He so crowded on my mind his list of nature's eccentricities and possible impossibilities that my imagination was getting fired. I had a dim idea that he was teaching me some lesson, as long ago he used to in his study at Amsterdam. But he used then to tell me the thing so that I could have an object of thought in mind all the time. But now I was without this help, yet I wanted to follow him. So I said, Professor, let me be your pet student again. Tell me the thesis that I may apply your knowledge as you go on. A 
at present I'm going in my mind from point to point as a madman, and not as a sane one follows an idea. I feel like a novice, lumbering through a bog in a mist, jumping from one tussock to another, in the mere blind effort to move on without knowing where I'm going. That is a good image, he said. Well, I shall tell you my thesis. Is this what I want you to believe? To believe what? To believe in things that you cannot. Me illustrate. I heard once of an American who so defined faith, that faculty which enables us to believe things which we know to be untrue. For one, I follow that man. He meant that we shall have an open mind and not let a little bit of truth check the rush of a big truth, like a small rock does on a railway truck. We get the small truth first. We keep him, we value him. But all the same, we must not let him think himself all the truth in the universe. Then you want me not to let some previous conviction injure the receptivity of my mind with regard to some strange matter. Do I read your lesson all right? Ah, you are my favourite pupil. It is worth to teach you. Now that you are willing to understand, you have taken the first step to understand. You think then that those so small holes in the children's throats were made by the same that made the hole in Miss Lucy? I suppose so. He stood up and said solemnly, then you are wrong. Or would it were so, but alas, no, it is worse, far worse. In God's name, Professor Van Helsing, what do you mean, I cried. He threw himself with a despairing gesture into a chair, placed his elbows on the table, covering his hands with his face, he spoke. They were made by Miss Lucy. End of chapter 14Chapter 15 of Dracula by Bram Stoker This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 Dr. Seward's Diary Continued For a while sheer anger mastered me. It was as if he had during her life struck Lucy on the face. I smote the table hard and rose up, as I said to him, Dr. Van Helsing, are you mad? He raised his head and looked at me, and somehow the tenderness of his face calmed me at once. Would I were, he said. Madness were easy to bear compared with truth like this. Oh, my friend, why think you did I go so far round? Why take so long to tell you so simple a thing? Was it because I hate you and have hated you all my life? Was it because I wished to give you pain? Was it that I wanted now so late revenge for that time when you saved my life and from a fearful death? Ah, oh, no. Forgive me, said I. He went on. My friend, it was because I wished to be gentle in the breaking to you, for I know you have loved that so sweet lady. But even yet I do not expect you to believe me. It is hard to accept at once any abstract truth that we may doubt such to be possible, when we have always believed the no of it. It is more hard still to accept so sad a concrete truth, and of such a one as Miss Lucy. Tonight I go to prove it. Dare you come with me? This staggered me. A man does not like to prove such a truth. Byron accepted from the category of jealousy, and proved the very truth he most abhorred. He saw my hesitation and spoke. The logic is simple. No madman's logic this time, jumping from tussock to tussock in a misty bog. If it be not true, then proof will be relief. At worst, it will not harm. If it be true, ah, there is the dread. Yet very dread should help my cause, for it is in some need of belief. Come, I tell you what I propose. First, that we go off now and see that child in the hospital. Dr. Vincent of the North Hospital, where the papers say the child is, is a friend of mine. And I think of yours since you were in class at Amsterdam. He will let two scientists see his case if he will not let two friends. 
we shall tell him nothing but only that we wish to learn and then and then he took a key from his pocket and held it up and then we spend the night you and i in the churchyard where lucy lies this is the key that locked the tomb i had it from my coffin man to give to arthur my heart sank within me for i felt that there was some fearful ordeal before us and i could do nothing however i plucked up on what i heard however i plucked up what heart i could and said that we had better hasten as the afternoon was passing we found the child awake it had had a sleep and taken some food and altogether was going on well dr vincent took the bandage from its throat and showed us punches there was no mistake in the similarity of those to which had been on lucy's throat they were smaller and the edges looked fresher that was all we asked vincent to what he attributed them and he replied it must have been a bite of some animal perhaps a rat but for his own part he was inclined to think it was one of the bats which are so numerous on the northern heights of london out of so many harmless ones he said there may be some wild specimen from the south and more malignant species some sailor may have brought one home and it managed to escape or even from zoological gardens a young one may have got loose or one bred there from a vampire but these things do occur you know only ten days ago a wolf got out and was i believe traced up in this direction for a week after the children were playing nothing but red riding hood on the heath in every alley in this place until the blue for lady scare came along since when it has been quite a gala time with them even this poor little mite when he woke up today and asked the nurse if he might go away when she asked him why he wanted to go he said he wanted to play with the blue for lady i hope said van helsing that when you are sending the child home you will caution its parents to keep strict watch over it these fancies to stray are most dangerous if a child were to remain another night it would probably be fatal but in any case i suppose you will not let it away for some days certainly not not for a week at least longer if the wound is not healed our visit to the hospital took more time than we had reckoned on and the sun had dipped before we came out when van helsing saw how dark it was he said there is no hurry it's a little more late than i thought come let us seek somewhere that we may eat and then we shall go on our way we dined at jack straw's castle along with a little crowd of bicyclists and others who were genially noisy about ten o'clock we started from the inn it was then very dark and the scattered lamps made the darkness greater when we were once outside of their individual radius the professor had evidently noted the road we were to go for he went on unhesitatingly but as for me i was in quite a mix-up as to locality as we went further we met fewer and fewer people till at last we were somewhat surprised when we even met the patrol of horse police going along their usual suburban round at last we reached the wall of the churchyard which we climbed over with some little difficulty for it was very dark and the whole place seemed so strange to us we found the western raton the professor took the key opened the creaky door and standing back politely but quite unconsciously motioned me to proceed him there was a delicious irony in the offer in the courtliness of giving preference on such a ghastly occasion my companion followed me quickly and cautiously drew the door to after carefully ascertaining that the lock was a falling and not a spring one in the latter case we should have been in a bad plight he then fumbled in his bag taking out a matchbox and a piece of candle proceeded to make a light the tomb in the daytime and when wreathed with fresh flowers had looked grim and gruesome enough but now some days afterwards when the flowers hung lank and dead their whites turning to rust and their greens to browns when the spider and the beetle had resumed their accustomed dominance when time discoloured stone and dust encrusted mortar 
and rusty dank iron and tarnished brass and clouded silver plating gave back the feeble glimmer of a candle the effect was more miserable and sordid than could ever have been imagined it conveyed irresistibly the idea that life it conveyed irresistibly the idea that life animal life was not the only thing which could pass away van helsing went about his work systematically holding his candle so that he could read the coffin plates and so holding it that the sperm dropped in white patches which congealed as they touched the metal he made assurance of lucy's coffin after another search in his bag he took out a turn screw what are you going to do i asked to open the coffin you shall be convinced straight away he began taking out the screws and finally lifted off the lid showing the casing of lead beneath the sight was almost too much for me it seemed to be as much an affront to the dead as it would have been to have stripped off her clothing in her sleep whilst living i actually took hold of his hand to stop him he only said you shall see and again fumbling in his bag took out a tiny fret saw striking the turn screw through the lead with a swift downward stab which made me wince he made a small hole which was however big enough to admit the point of a saw i had expected a rush of gas from the weak old corpse we doctors who have had to study our dangers have to become accustomed to such things and i drew back towards the door but the professor never stopped for a moment he sawed down a couple of feet along one side of the lead coffin and then across and down the other side taking the edge off the loose flange he bent it back towards the foot of the coffin and holding up the candle into the aperture motioned me to look i drew near and looked the coffin was empty it was certainly a surprise to me and gave me a considerable shock but van helsing was unmoved he was no more sure than ever of his ground and so emboldened to proceed in his task are you satisfied now friend john he asked i felt all the dogged argumentativeness of my nature awake within me as i answered him i am satisfied that lucy's body is not in that coffin but that only proves one thing and what is that friend john that it is not there that's good logic he said so far as it goes but how do you, how can you account for it not being there? It's a body satchel, I suggested. Some of the undertaker's people may have stolen it. I felt that I was speaking folly, and yet it was the only real cause which I could suggest. The professor sighed. Ah, oh, well, he said, we shall have more proof. Come with me. He put on the coffin lid again, gathered up all his things and placed them in the bag blew out the light and placed the candle also in the bag. We opened the door and went out. Behind us, he closed the door and locked it. He handed me the key, saying, Will you keep it? You had better be assured. I laughed. It was not a very cheerful laugh, I'm bound to say, as I motioned him to keep it. The key is nothing, I said. There may be duplicates, and anyhow, it's not difficult to pick a lock of that kind. He said nothing, but put the key in his pocket. And he told me to watch at one side of the churchyard whilst he would watch the other i took up my place behind a yew tree and i saw his dark figure move until the intervening headstones and trees hid it from my sight it was a lonely vigil just after i'd taken my place i heard a distant clock strike twelve and in time came one and two i was chilled and unnerved and angry with the professor for taking me on such an errand and with myself for coming i was too cold too sleepy to be keenly observant and not sleepy enough to betray my trust so altogether i had a dreary miserable time suddenly as i turned round i thought i saw something like a white streak moving between two dark yew trees at the side of the churchyard furthest from the tomb at the same time, a dark mass moved from the professor's side of the ground and hurriedly went towards it. 
then I too moved, but I had to go round headstones and railed off tombs, and I stumbled over grave. The sky was overcast, and somewhere far off an early cock crew. A little way off beyond a line of scattered juniper trees which marked the pathway to the church, a white dim figure flitted in the direction of the tomb. The tomb itself was hidden by trees, and I could not see where the figure disappeared. I heard the rustle of actual movement where I had first seen the white figure, and coming over, found the professor holding in his arms a tiny child. When he saw me, he held it out to me and said, Are you satisfied now? No, I said in a way that I felt was aggressive. Did you not see the child? Yes, it is a child, but who brought it here? And is it wounded, I asked. We shall see, said the professor. And with one impulse we took our way out of the churchyard, he carrying the sleeping child. We had got some little distance away, we went into a clump of trees and struck a match, and looked at the child's throat. It was without a scratch or a scar of any kind. Was I right? I asked triumphantly. We were just in time, said the Professor thankfully. We now had to decide what we were to do with the child, and so consulted about it. If we were to take it to a police station, we should have to give some account of our movements during the night. At least we should have to make some statement as to how we had come to find the child. So finally we decided that we would take it to the heath. When we heard a policeman coming, would leave it where he could not fail to find it. We would then seek our way home as quickly as we could. All fell out well. At the edge of Hampstead Heath, when we heard the heavy policeman's tramp and laying the child on the pathway, we waited and watched until he saw it as he flashed his lantern to and fro. We heard his exclamation of astonishment, and then we went away silently. By good chance we got a cab near the Spaniards and drove to town. I cannot sleep, so I make this entry, but I must try to get a few hours sleep, as Van Helsing is to call for me at noon. He insists that I shall go with him on another expedition. 27th of September It was two o'clock before we found a suitable opportunity for our attempt. The funeral held at noon was all completed, and the last stragglers of the mourners had taken themselves lazily away. When, looking carefully from behind a clump of alder trees, we saw the sexton lock the gate after him. We knew then that we were still safe till morning. Did we desire it? But the professor told me that we should not want more than an hour at most. Again, I felt that horrid sense of the reality of things, in which any effort of imagination seemed out of place. I realised distinctly the perils of the law which we were incurring in our unhallowed work. Besides, I felt it was all so useless, outrageous as it was to open a leaden coffin, to see if a woman dead nearly a week were really dead. It now seemed the height of folly to open the tomb again, when we knew from the evidence of our own eyesight that the coffin was empty. I shrugged my shoulders, however, and rested silent. For Van Helsing had a way of going on his own road, no matter who remonstrated. He took the key, opened the vault again, and courteously motioned me to proceed. The place was not so gruesome as last night, but oh how unutterably mean looking when the sunshine streamed in. Van Helsing walked over to Lucy's coffin and I followed. He bent over and again forced back the leaden flange, and then a shock of surprise and dismay shot through me. There lay Lucy, seemingly just as we had seen her the night before her funeral. She was, if possible, more radiantly beautiful than ever, and I could not believe that she was dead. The lips were red, nay, redder than before, and on the cheeks was a delicate bloom. Is this a juggle? I said to him. Are you convinced now? said the professor in response. And as he spoke, he put over his hand, and in a way that made me shudder, pulled back the dead lips and showed the white teeth. See, he went on, see they are even sharper than before. And with this, and he touched one of the canine teeth, and that below it, the little children can be bitten. Are you of belief now, friend John? 
Once more argumentative hostility woke within me. I could not accept such an overwhelming idea as he suggested. So with an attempt to argue, of which I was even at the moment ashamed, I said, she may have been placed here since last night. Indeed, that is so, and by whom? I, I do not know. Someone has done it. And yet she's been dead one week. Most people in that time would not look so... I had no answer for this. So was silent. Van Helsing did not seem to notice my silence at any rate. He showed neither chagrin nor triumph. He was looking intently at the face of the dead woman, raising the eyelids and looking at the eyes, once more opening the lips and examining the teeth. And then he turned to me and said, Here is one thing which is different from all recorded. Here is some dual life that is not as the common. She was bitten by the vampire when she was in a trance, sleepwalking. Oh, you start, do you not know that, friend John? But you shall know it all later. And in trance could he best come to take more blood. In trance she died, and in trance she is undead too. So it is that she differ from all other. Usually when undead sleep at home, as he spoke, he made a comprehensive sweep of his arm to designate what to a vampire was home. Their face show what they are, but this so sweet that when she was not undead, she go back to nothing of common dead. There is no malign there, see? And to make it hard, I must kill her in her sleep. This turned my blood cold it began to dawn upon me that I was accepting Van Helsing's theories. But if she were really dead, what was there of terror in the idea of killing her? He looked at me and evidently saw the change in my face. For he said almost joyously, Ah, you believe now? I answered, Do not press me too hard all at once. I am willing to accept. How will you do this bloody work? I shall cut off her head and fill her mouth with garlic, and I shall drive a stake through her body. It made me shudder to think of so mutilating the body of the woman whom I had loved, and yet the feeling was not so strong as I had expected. I was in fact beginning to shudder at the presence of this being, this undead as Van Helsing called it, and to loathe it. Is it possible that love is all subjective or all objective? I waited a considerable time for Van Helsing to begin, but he stood as if wrapped in thought. Presently he closed the catch of his bag with a snap and said, I have been thinking, I have made up my mind as to what is best. If I did simply follow my inclining, I would do now at this moment. I would do now at this moment what is to be done. But there are other things to follow, and things that are a thousand times more difficult. In that, them, we do not know. This is simple. She have yet no life taken, though that is of time, and to act now would be to take danger from her forever. But then we may have to want Arthur. And how shall we tell him of this? If you, who saw the wounds on Lucy's throat, and saw the wounds so similar on the child's at the hospital, if you, who saw the empty coffin last night and full today, were the woman who have not changed, only to be made more rose and more beautiful in a whole week after she died, if you know of this, and know of the white figure last night that brought the child to the churchyard, and yet of your own senses you did not believe, how, then, can I expect Arthur who know none of these things, to believe. He doubted me when I took him from a, a kiss when she was dying. I know he has forgiven me because in some mistaken idea I have done things that prevent him say goodbye as he ought. And he may think that in some more mistaken idea this woman was buried alive and that in most mistake of all we have killed her. He will then argue that it is we, mistaken ones, that have killed her by our ideas, and so he will be much unhappy always. Yet he never can be sure, and that is the worst of all, and he will sometimes think that she he loved was buried alive. 
and that will paint his dreams with horrors of what she must have suffered and again he will think that we may be right and that his so beloved was after all an undead no i told him at once since then i learned much now since i know it is all true a hundred thousand times more do i know that he must pass through the bitter waters to reach the sweet he the poor fellow must have one hour that will make the very face of heaven grow black to him then we can act for good all round and send him peace my mind is made up let us go you return home for tonight to your asylum and see that all be well as for me i shall spend the night here in this churchyard in my own way tomorrow night you will come to me to the berkeley hotel at ten of the clock i shall send for arthur to come too and also that fine young man of america that gave his blood later we shall all have work to do i come with you so far as piccadilly and there dine for i must be back here before the sun set so we locked the tomb we came away and got over the wall of the churchyard which was not much of a task and drove back to piccadilly note left by van helsing in his portmanteau berkeley hotel directed to john seward m d not delivered 27th of september friend john i write this in case anything should happen i go alone to watch in that churchyard it pleases me that the undead miss lucy shall not leave tonight so that on the morrow night she may be more eager therefore i shall fix some things she like not garlic and a crucifix and so seal up the door of the tomb she is young as an undead and will heed moreover these are only to prevent her coming out they may not prevail on her wanting to get in or well, then the undead is desperate and must find the line of least resistance whatsoever it may be i shall be at hand all night from sunset until after the sunrise and if there be aught that may be learned i shall learn it from miss lucy or from her i have no fear but to the other to whom there is she is an undead he now have the power to seek her tomb and find shelter he is cunning as i know from mr jonathan and from the way that all along he hath fooled us when he played with us for miss lucy's life and we lost and in many ways the undead are strong have always the strength of his hand of twenty men even we four who gave our strength to miss lucy it is also all to him beside he can summon his wolf i know not what so if it be that he come thither on this night he shall find me but none other shall until it is too late but it may be that he will not attempt the place there is no reason why he should his hunting ground is more full of game than the churchyard where the undead women sleep and the one old man watch therefore i write this in case take the papers that are with this the diaries of harker and the rest and read them and then find this great undead and cut off his head and burn his heart or drive a stake through it so that the world may rest from him if it be so farewell van helsing dr seward's diary 28th of september it is wonderful what a good night's sleep will do for one yesterday i was almost willing to accept van helsing's monstrous ideas but now they seem to start out lurid before me as outrages on common sense i have no doubt that he believes it all i wonder if his mind could have become in any way unhinged surely there must be some rational explanation of all these mysterious things is it possible that the professor could have done it himself he is so abnormally clever that if he went off his head he would carry out his intent with regard to some fixed idea in a wonderful way i am loath to think it and indeed it would be almost as great a marvel as the other to find that van helsing was mad but anyhow i shall watch him carefully i may get some light on the mystery 29th of september morning 
Last night, at a little before ten o'clock, Arthur and Quincy came into Van Helsing's room. He told us all what he wanted us to do, but especially addressed himself to Arthur, as if all our wills were centred in his. He began by saying that he hoped we would come with him too, for, he said, there is a grave duty to be done there. You were doubtless surprised at my letter. This query was directly addressed to Lord Godalming. I was. It rather upset me for a bit. There has been so much trouble around my house of late, that I could do without any more. I have been curious, too, as to what you mean. Quincy and I talked it over, but the more we talked, the more puzzled we got. Till now I can say for myself, I'm about up a tree as to any meaning about anything. Me too, said Quincy Morris, laconically. Oh, said the Professor. And you are nearer the beginning, both of you, than your friend John here, who has to go a long way back before he even gets so far as to begin. It was evident that he recognised my return to my old doubting frame of mind without my saying a word, and he turned to the other two. He said with intense gravity, I want your permission to do what I think good this night. It is, I know, much to ask, and when you know what it is I propose to do, you will know, and only then, how much. Therefore may I ask that you promise me in the dark, so that afterwards so you may be angry with me for a time. I must not disguise myself for the possibility that such may be. You shall not blame yourselves for anything. Well, that's frank anyhow, broke in Quincy. I'll answer for the Professor. I don't quite get his drift, but I swear he's honest, and that's good enough for me. I thank you, sir, said Van Helsing proudly. I've done myself the honour of counting you one trusting friend, and such endorsement is dear to me. He held out his hand, which Quincy took. Arthur spoke out. Dr. Van Helsing, I don't quite like to buy a pig in a poke, as they say in Scotland. If it be anything in which my honour as a gentleman or my faith as a Christian is concerned, I cannot make such a promise. If you can assure me that what you intend does not violate either of these two, then I give my consent at once, though for the life of me I cannot understand what you are driving at. I accept your limitation, said Van Helsing, and all I ask of you is that you feel it necessary to condemn any act of mine. You will first consider it well and be satisfied that it does not violate your reservation. Agreed, said Arthur, that is only fair. And now that the poor parlours are over, may I ask what it is we are to do? I want you to come with me, and come in secret, to the churchyard at Kingstead. Arthur's face fell, and he said in an amazed sort of way, Where poor Lucy is buried? Professor bowed. Arthur went on, and when there? To enter the tomb. Arthur stood up. Professor, are you in earnest, or is this some monstrous joke? Pardon me, I see that you are in earnest. He sat down again. But I could see that he sat firmly and proudly as one who is on his dignity. There was a silence until he asked again, and when in the tomb, to open the coffin. This is too much, he said, angrily rising again. I am willing to be patient in all things that are reasonable, but in this, the desecration of the grave of one who, he fairly choked with indignation, the Professor looked pityingly at him. If I could spare you one pang, my poor friend, he said. God knows I would. But this night our feet must tread in thorny paths, or later and forever the feet you love must walk in paths of flame. Arthur looked up with a set white face and said, Take care, sir, take care. Would it not be well to hear what I have to say, said Van Helsing? and then you will at least know the limit of my purpose. Shall I go on? That's fair enough, broke in Morris. After a pause, Van Helsing went on, evidently with an effort. Miss Lucy is dead, is it not so? Yes, and there can be no wrong to her. But if she not, but, but if she be not dead? Arthur jumped to his feet. Good God, he cried, what do you mean? Has there been any mistake? Has she been buried alive? He groaned in anguish, not even hope could soften. 
I did not say she was alive, my child. I did not think it. I go no further than to say she might be undead. Undead? Alive? What do you mean? Is this all a nightmare, or what is it? There are mysteries which men can only guess at, which age by age they may solve only in part. Believe me, believe me, we are now on the verge of one. But I have not done. May I cut off the head of Miss Lucy? Heavens and earth, no, cried Arthur with a storm of passion. Not for the wide world will I consent to any mutilation of her dead body. Dr. Van Helsing, you try me too far. What have I done to you that you should torture me so? What did that poor sweet girl do to you that you should want to cast such dishonour on her grave? Are you mad that you speak of such things, or am I mad to listen to them? Don't dare to think any more of such a desecration. I shall not give my consent to anything you do. I have a duty to do in protecting her grave and outrage, and by God I shall do it. Van Helsing rose up from where he had all the time been seated and said gravely and sternly, My Lord Godalming, I too have a duty to do. A duty to others, a duty to you, a duty to the dead, and by God I shall do it. All I ask you now is that you come with me, that you look and listen, and if when later I make the same request, you do not be more eager for its fulfilment even than I am, then I shall do my duty, whatever it may seem to me, and then to follow your lordship's wishes, I shall hold myself at your disposal and render an account to you, when and where you will. His voice broke a little as he went on with a voice full of pity. But I, I beseech you, do not go forth in anger with me in a, in a long life of acts, which were often not pleasant to do and which sometimes did wring my heart. I have never had so heavy a task as now. Believe me, if that time comes for you to change your mind towards me, one look from you will wipe away all of this so sad hour, for I will do what a man can do to save you from sorrow. Just think, for why should I give myself so much of labour and so much of sorrow? I have come here from my own land to do what I can look good, at the first to please my friend John, and then to help a sweet young lady, whom too I came to love. For her, I am ashamed to say so much, but I say it in kindness. I gave what you gave, the blood of my veins, I gave it. I, who was not like you, her lover, but only her physician and her friend. I gave to her my nights and days, before death, after death. And if my death could do her good even now, when she is the dead, undead, she shall have it freely. He said this with a very grave, sweet pride. And Arthur was much affected by it. He took the old man's hand and said in a broken voice, Oh, it's hard to think of it, and I cannot understand. But at least I shall go with you and wait. End of chapter 15Chapter 16 of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16. Dr. Seward's diary continued. It was just a quarter before twelve o'clock when we got into the churchyard over the low wall. The night was dark, with occasional gleams of moonlight between the rents of the heavy clouds that scudded across the sky. We all kept somehow close together, with Van Helsing slightly in front as he led the way. When we had come close to the tomb, I looked well at Arthur, for I feared that a proximity to a place laden with so sorrowful a memory would upset him. But he bore himself well. I took it that the very mystery of the proceeding was in some way counter-reacting to his grief. 
The Professor unlocked the door, and seeing a natural hesitation amongst us for various reasons, solved the difficulty by entering first himself. The rest of us followed and he closed the door. He then lit a dark lantern and pointed to the coffin. Arthur stepped forward hesitatingly. Van Helsing said to me, You were with me here yesterday. Was the body of Miss Lucy laid in that coffin? It was. The Professor turned to the rest, saying, You hear? And yet there is no one who does not believe with me. He took his screwdriver and again took off the lid of the coffin. Arthur looked on, very pale but silent. When the lid was removed, he stepped forward. He evidently did not know that there was a leaden coffin, or at any rate had not thought of it. When he saw the rent in the lead, blood rushed to his face for an instant, but as quickly fell away again, so that he remained of a ghastly whiteness. He was still silent. Van Helsing forced back the leaden flange, and we all looked in and recoiled. The coffin was empty. For nearly several minutes, no one spoke a word. The silence was broken by Quincy Morris. Professor, I answered for you. Your word is all I want. I wouldn't ask for such a thing ordinarily. I wouldn't so dishonour you as to imply a doubt. But this is a mystery that goes beyond any honour or dishonour. Is this your doing? I swear to you by all that I hold sacred that I have not removed nor touched her. What happened was this. Two nights ago my friend Seward and I came here. With good purpose, believe me. I opened that coffin, which was then sealed up, and we found it as it is now, empty. We then waited and saw something white come through the trees. The next day we came here in daytime, and she lay there. Did she not, friend John? Yes. That night we were just in time, once more, so small a child was missing. And we find it, thank God, unharmed amongst the graves. Yesterday I came here before sundown, for at sundown the undead can move. I waited here all the night till the sun rose, but I saw nothing. It was most probable it was because... I had laid over the clamps of those doors garlic, which the undead cannot bear. Last night there was no exodus, so tonight, before the sundown, I took away my garlic and other things. So it is we find this coffin empty. But bear with me. So far there is much that is strange. Wait you with me outside, unseen and unheard, and things much stranger are yet to be. So... Here he shut the dark side of his lantern. Now to the outside. He opened the door and we filed out. He coming last and locking the door behind him. Oh, but it seemed fresh and pure in the night air after the terror of that vault. How sweet it was to see the clouds race by and the passing gleams of the moonlight between the scudding clouds crossing and passing like the gladness and sorrow of a man's life. How sweet it was to breathe the fresh air that had no taint of death and decay. How humanising to see the red lighting in the sky beyond the hill and to hear afar away the muffled roar that marks the life of a great city. Each in his own way was solemn and overcome. Arthur was silent and was, I could see, striving to grasp the purpose, the inner meaning of the mystery. I was myself tolerably patient and half inclined again to throw aside doubt and to accept Van Helsing's conclusions. Quincy Morris was phlegmatic in the way of a man who accepts all things and accepts them in the spirit of cool bravery with hazard of all he has to stake. Not being able to smoke, he cut himself a good sized plug of tobacco and began to chew. As to Van Helsing, he was employed in a definite way. First, he took from his bag a mass of what looked like thin wafer-like biscuit, which was carefully rolled up in a white napkin. Next, he took out a double handful of some whitish stuff, like dough or putty. He crumbled the wafer up fine and worked it into the mass between his hands. This he then took 
and rolling it into thin strips, began to lay them into the crevices between the door and its setting in the tomb. I was somewhat puzzled at this, and being close, asked him what it was that he was doing. Arthur and Quincy drew near also, as they too were curious. He answered, I am closing the tomb, so that the undead may not enter. And is that stuff you have there going to do it? asked Quincy. Great Scott, is this a game? It is. What is that which you are using? This time the question was by Arthur. Van Helsing reverently lifted his hat as he answered. The host. I bought it from Amsterdam. I have an indulgence. It was an answer that appalled the most sceptical of us. And we felt individually that the presence of such earnest purpose as a purpose which could thus use the to him most sacred of things, it was impossible to distrust. In respectful silence we took the places assigned to us close around the tomb, but hidden from the sight of anyone approaching. I pitied the others, especially Arthur. I myself had been apprenticed by my former visits to this watching horror, and yet I, who had up to an hour ago repudiated the proofs, felt my heart sink within me. Never did tombs look so ghastly white. Never did cypress or yew or juniper so seem the embodiment of funereal gloom. Never did tree or grass wave or rustle so ominously. Never did bough creak so mysteriously. And never did the faraway howling of dogs send such a woeful presage through the night. There was a long spell of silence big aching void, and then from the Professor a keen He pointed, and far down the avenue of views we saw a white figure advance, a dim white figure which held something dark at its breast. The figure stopped, and at the moment a ray of moonlight fell upon the masses of driving clouds, and showed us in startling prominence a dark-haired woman dressed in the cerements of the grave. We could not see the face for it was bent down over what we saw to be a fair-haired child. There was a pause and a sharp little cry, such as a child gives in his sleep, or a dog as he lies before the fire and dreams. We were starting forward, but the Professor's warning hand, seen by us as he stood behind the yew tree, kept us back. And then as we looked, the white figure moved forwards again, it was now enough for us to see clearly, and the moonlight still held. My own heart grew cold as ice. I could hear the gasp of Arthur as we recognised the features of Lucy Westenler. Lucy Westenler, but how changed. The sweetness was turned to amadantine, heartless cruelty, and the purity to voluptuous wantonness. Van Helsing stepped out and obedient to his gesture, we all advanced too, the four of us ranged in a line before the door of the tomb. Van Helsing raised his lantern and drew the slide. By the concentrated light that fell on Lucy's face, we could see that the lips were crimson with fresh blood, and that the stream had trickled over her chin and stained the purity of her lawn death robe. We shuddered with horror. I could see by the tremendous light that even Van Helsing's iron nerve had failed. Arthur was next to me, and if I had not seized his arm and held him up, he would have fallen. When Lucy, I call the thing that was before us Lucy, because it bore her shape. As she drew back with an angry snarl, such as a cat gives when taken unawares, then her eyes ranged over us, Lucy's eyes in form and colour, but Lucy's eyes are unclean and full of hellfire, instead of the pure, gentle orbs we knew. At that moment the remnant of my love passed into hate and loathing. Had she then to be killed, I could have done it with savage delight. As she looked, her eyes blazed with unholy light, and the face became wreathed with a voluptuous smile. Oh God, how it made me shudder to see it with a careless motion. She flung to the ground, as callous as a devil, the child that up to now she had clutched strenuously to her breast, 
growling over it as a dog growls over a bone. The child gave a sharp cry and lay there moaning. There was a cold-heartedness in the act, which wrung a groan for Martha. When she advanced to him with outstretched arms and a wanton smile, he fell back and hid his face in his hands. Still she advanced, however, and with a languorous, voluptuous grace said, Come to me, Arthur. Leave these others and come to me. My arms are hungry for you. Come and we can rest together. Come, my husband, come. There was something diabolically sweet in her tones, something of the tingling of glass when struck, which rang through the brains even of us who heard the words addressed to another. As for Arthur, he seemed to be under a spell. Moving his hands from his face, he opened wide his arms. She was leaping for them, and Van Helsing sprang foot toward and held between them his little gold crucifix. She recoiled from it, and with a suddenly distorted face, full of rage, dashed past him as if to enter the tomb. When within a foot or two of the door, however, she stopped, as if arrested by some irresistible force. Then she turned and her face was shown in a clear burst of moonlight and by the lamp which she now had no quiver from Van Helsing's iron nerves. Never did I see such baffled malice on her face, and none I trust shall ever be seen again by mortal eyes. The beautiful colour became livid. The eyes seemed to throw out sparks of hell by her. The brows were wrinkled as though the folds of flesh were the coils of Medusa snakes, and the lovely blood-stained mouth grew to an open square, as in the passion marks of the Greeks and Japanese. If ever a face meant death, if looks could kill, we saw it all that night. And for a full half-minute, which seemed an eternity, she remained between the lifted crucifix and the sacred closing of her means of entry. When Helsing broke the silence by asking Arthur, Answer me, O oh my friend, am I to proceed in my work? Arthur threw himself on his knees and hid his face in his hands as he answered, Do as you will, friend, do as you will. There can be no horror like this ever any more. And he groaned in spirit. Quincy and I simultaneously moved towards him and took his arms. We could hear the click of the closing lantern as Van Helsing held it down, coming close to the tomb. He began to remove from the chinks some of the sacred emblem which he had placed there. We all looked on in horrified amazement as we saw when he stood back, the woman with a corporeal body as real at that moment as our own, passed through the interstices where scarce a knife blade could have gone. We all felt the glad sense of relief when we saw the Professor calmly restoring the strings of putty to the edges of the door. When this was done, he lifted the child and said, Come now, my friends, we can do no more till tomorrow. There is a funeral at noon, so here we shall all come before long after that. The friends of the dead will all be gone by two, and when the sexton locked the gate, we shall remain. There is more to do but not like this of tonight. As for this little one, he is not much harm, and by tomorrow night he shall be well. We shall leave him where the police will find him, as on the other night, and then go home. Come in close to Arthur, he said. My friend Arthur, you have had a sore trial, but after when you look back you will see how it was necessary. You are now in the bitter waters, my child, by this time tomorrow you will, please God, have passed them and have drunk of the sweet waters. So do not mourn over much. Till then, I shall not ask you to forgive me. Arthur and Quincy came home with me, and we tried to cheer each other up along the way. We had left the child in safety and were tired. So we all slept with more or less reality of sleep. 29th of September, night. A little before 12 o'clock, we three, Arthur, Quincy, Morris and myself, called for the Professor. It was odd to notice that by common consent we had all put on our black clothes. 
Of course, Arthur wore black, for he was in deep mourning, but the rest of us wore it by instinct. We got to the churchyard by half past one and strolled about keeping out of official observation, so that when the grave diggers had completed their task and the sexton, under the belief that everyone had gone, had locked the gate, we had the place all to ourselves. Van Helsing, instead of his little black bag, had with him a long leather one, something like a cricketing bag. It was manifestly of fair weight. When we were alone, and I had heard the last of the footsteps die out up the road, we silently, and as if by all his intention, followed the Professor to the tomb. He unlocked the door and we entered, closing it behind us. Then he took from his bag the lantern, which he lit, and also two wax candles, which, when lighted, he stuck by melting their own ends on other coffins, so that they might give light sufficient to work by. And when he again lifted the lid of Lucy's coffin, we all looked, Arthur trembling like an aspen, and saw that the body lay there in all its death beauty. But there was no love in my own heart, and nothing but loathing for the foul thing which had taken Lucy's shape without her soul. I could see even Arthur's face grow hard as he looked. Presently he said to Van Helsing, Is this really Lucy's body, or only a demon in her shape? It is her body, and yet not it. But wait a while, and you will see her as she was, and is. She seemed like a nightmare of Lucy as she lay there, the pointed teeth, the blood-stained, voluptuous mouth, which made one shudder to see the whole carnal and unspiritual appearance seeming like a devilish mockery of Lucy's sweet purity. Van Helsing, with his usual methodicalness, began taking the various contents from his bag and placing them ready for use. First he took out a soldering iron and some plumbing solder, and then a small oil lamp which gave out when lit in the corner of the tomb, gas which burned at a fierce heat with a blue flame and then his operating knives which he placed at hand, and at last a round wooden stake, some two and a half or three inches thick, and about three feet long. One of it was hardened by charring in the fire, and was sharpened to a fine point. With this stake came a heavy hammer, such as in households is used in the coal cellar for breaking up the lumps. To me, a doctor's preparations for work of any kind are stimulating and bracing. But the effect of these things on both Arthur and Quincy was to cause them a sort of consternation. They both, however, kept their courage and remained silent and quiet. When it was all ready, Van Helsing said, Before we do anything, let me tell you this. It is out of the law and experience of the ancients and of all those who have studied the powers of the undead when they become such. There comes with the charge the curse of immortality. They cannot die, but must go on age after age, adding new victims and multiplying the evils of the world, for all that die from the praying of the undead becomes themselves undead, and prey on their kind. And so the circle goes on ever widening, like as a ripple from a stone thrown in the water. Friend Arthur, if you had met that kiss which you know of before poor Lucy died, or again last night, when you open your arms to her, you would in time, when you had died, become Nosferatu, as they call it in Eastern Europe, and would all time make more of those undeads that have so filled us with horror. The career of this is so unhappy, dear lady, but it's just begun. Those children who blood she sucked, are not as yet so much the worse. But if she live on, undead more and more, they lose their blood, and by her power over them, they come to her. And so she draw their blood with a so wicked mouth. But if she die, in truth, then all cease. The tiny wounds of the throats disappear, and they go back to their plays. But the most blessed of all, and is now undead to be made to rest with the true dead, and the soul of the poor lady whom we love shall again be free, instead of working wickedness by night and growing more debased in the assimilating of it by day. She shall take her place with the other angels, 
So that, my friend, shall be a blessed hand for her that will strike the blow that sets her free. To this I am willing, but is there none amongst you who has a better right? Will it be no joy to think of hereafter the silence of the night when sleep is not? It was my hand that sent her to the stars. It was the hand of him that loved her best. The hand that all she would have herself chosen had it been to her to choose. Tell me if there be such a one amongst us. We all looked at Arthur. He saw too what we all did. The infinite kindness was suggested that his should be the hand which would restore Lucy to us as a holy and not an unholy memory. Step forward and said bravely so his hand trembled and his face was as pale as snow. My true friend, from the bottom of my broken heart, I thank you. Tell me what I am to do and I shall not falter. And Helsing laid a hand on his shoulder and said, Brave lad, a moment's courage and it is done. This stake must be driven through her. It will be a fearful ordeal. Be not deceived in that, but it will only be a short time, and then you will rejoice once more that your pain was great. From this grim tomb, you will emerge as though you tread on air, but you must not falter when once you have begun. Only think that we, your true friends, are round you, and that we pray for you all the time. Go on, said Arthur hoarsely. Tell me what I am to do. Take this stake in your left hand, ready to place the point over the heart, and the hammer in your right. And then when we begin our prayer for the dead, I shall read him. I have here the book, and the others shall follow. Strike in God's name, so that all may be well with the dead that we love, and the undead pass away. Arthur took the stake and the hammer. And when once his mind was set on action, his hands never trembled or even quivered. Van Helsing opened his missal and began to read, and Quincy and I followed as well as we could. Arthur placed the point over the heart, and as I looked I could see its dint in the white flesh. Then he struck with all his might. The thing in the coffin writhed in a hideous blood-curdling screech came from the open red lips. The body shook and quivered and twisted in wild contortion. The sharp white teeth champed together till the lips were cut and the mouth was smeared with a crimson foam. But Arthur never faltered. He looked like a figure of Thor as his untrembling arm rose and fell, driving deeper and deeper the mercy-bearing stake, whilst the blood from the pierced heart welled and spurted up around it. His face was set, and high duty seemed to shine through it. The sight of it gave us courage, so that our voices seemed to ring through the little vault. And then the writhing and quivering of the body became less. The teeth seemed to champ, and the face to quiver. Finally it lay still. A terrible task was over. The hammer fell from Arthur's hand. He reeled and would have fallen had we not caught him. The great drops of sweat sprang from his forehead and his breath came in broken gasps. It had indeed been an awful strain on him and he had not been forced to his task. By more than human considerations, he could never have gone through with it. For a few minutes, we were so taken up with him, we did not look towards the coffin. When we did, however, a murmur of startled surprise ran from one of the other to us. We gazed so eagerly that Arthur rose for he had been seated on the ground and came and looked too. And then a glad, strange light broke over his face and dispelled altogether the look of horror that lay upon it. There in the coffin lay no longer the foul thing that we had so dreaded and grown to hate that the work of her destruction was yielded as a privilege to the one best entitled to do it. But Lucy, as we had seen her in life, with her face of unequal sweetness and purity, True that there were, as we had seen them in life, the traces of care and pain and waste, but these were all dear to us, for they marked her truth to what we knew. One and all we felt that the holy calm that lay like sunshine over the wasted face and form was only an earthly token and a symbol of the calm that was to reign forever. 
Van Helsing came and laid his hand on Arthur's shoulder and said to him, And now, Arthur, my friend, dear lad, am I not forgiven? The reaction of the terrible strain came as he took the old man's hand in his and raising it to his lips, pressed it and said, Forgiven? God bless you that you have given my dear one her soul again, and me peace. He put his hands on the professor's shoulder and laying his head on his breast, cried for a while silently, whilst we stood unmoving. When he raised his head, Van Helsing said to him, And now, my child, you may kiss her. Kiss her dead lips, if you will, as she would have you to, for her to choose. For she is not a grinning devil now, nor any more a foul thing for all eternity. No longer is she the devil's undead. She is God's true dead, whose soul is within. Arthur bent and kissed her, and then we sent him and Quincy out of the tomb. The Professor and I sawed the top of the stake, leaving the point in the body, and we cut off the head and filled the mouth with garlic. We soldered up the lead coffin, screwed the coffin lid, and gathering up our belongings came away. When the Professor locked the door, he gave the key to Arthur. Outside the air was sweet, the sun shone, and the birds sang and it seemed as if all nature were tuned to a different pitch. There was gladness and mirth and peace everywhere, for we were at rest ourselves on the one account, and we were glad, though it was tempered by joy. Before we moved away, Van Helsing said, Now, my friends, one step of our work is done, one the most harrowing to ourselves, but there remains a greater task to find out the author of all this our sorrow and to stamp him out. I have clues which we can follow, but it is a long task and a difficult, and there is a danger in it, and pain. Shall you not help me? We have learned to believe, all of us, is it not so? And since so, do we not see our duty? Yes. And do we not promise to go on to the bitter end? Each in turn we took his hand, and the promise was made. Then the Professor said as we moved off, Two nights hence you shall meet with me and dine together at seven of the clock with friend John. I shall entreat two others, two that you know not as yet, and I shall be ready to all our work show and our plans unfold. Friend John, you come with me home, for I have much to consult about, and you can help me. Tonight I leave for Amsterdam, and I shall return tomorrow night, and then begins our great quest. But first, I shall have much to say, so that you may know what it is to do and dread. Then our promise shall be made to each other and you, for there is a terrible task before us. And once our feet are on the ploughshare, we must not draw back. End of chapter 16《Chapter 17 of Dracula by Bram Stoker》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 Dr. Seward's Diary Continued When we arrived at the Berkeley Hotel, Van Helsing found a telegram waiting for him. And coming up by train, Jonathan at Whitby Important news, Mina Harker. The professor was delighted. Ah, oh, that's wonderful, Madame Mina, he said. Pearl among women. She arrived, but I cannot stay. She must go to your house, friend John. We must meet her at the station. Telegraph her en route, so that she may be prepared. When the wire was dispatched, he had a cup of tea. Over it, he told me of a diary kept by Jonathan Harker, when abroad, and gave me a typewritten copy of it, also of Mrs. Harker's diary at Whitby. Take these, he said, and study them well. When I have returned, you will be master of all the facts, and we can then better enter in our inquisition. Keep them safe, for who have had such an experience as that of today? What is here told? He laid his hand heavily and gravely on the packet of papers as he spoke. Maybe the beginning of the end for to you and me and many other. Or it may sound the knell of the undead who walk the earth. 
read all I pray you with an open mind. And if you can add in any way to the story here told, do so, for it is all important. You have kept a diary of all those so strange things, is it not so? Yes, then we shall go through all these together when we meet. He then made ready for his departure, and shortly after drove off to Liverpool Street. I took my way to Paddington, for I arrived about fifteen minutes before the train came in. The crowd melted away after the bustling fashion common to arrival platforms. I was beginning to feel uneasy, lest I might miss my guests, when a sweet-faced, dainty-looking girl stepped up to me, and after a quick glance said, Dr. Seward, is it not? And you are Mrs. Harker, I answered at once, whereupon she held out her hand. I knew you from the description of poor dear Lucy, but she stopped suddenly and a quick blush overspread her face. The blush rose to my own cheek, somehow set us both at ease, for it was a tacit answer to her own. I got her luggage, which included a typewriter, and we took the underground to Fenchurch Street, after I had sent a wire to my housekeeper to have a sitting room and bedroom prepared at once for Mrs. Harker. In due time we arrived. She knew, of course, that the place was a lunatic asylum, but I could see that she was unable to repress a shudder when we entered. She told me that if she might, she would come presently to my study, as she had much to say. So here I am, finishing my entry in my phonograph diary, whilst I await her. As yet, I have not had the chance of looking at the papers which Van Helsing left with me, though they lay open before me. I must get her interested in something, so that I may have an opportunity of reading them. She does not know how precious time is, or what a task we have in hand. I must be careful not to frighten her. Here she is. Mina Harker's Journal, 29th of September. After I had tidied myself, I went down to Dr. Seward's study. At the door I paused a moment, for I thought I heard him talking with someone. As, however, he had pressed me to be quick, I knocked at the door, and upon his calling out, Come in! I entered. To my intense surprise, there was no one with him. He was quite alone, and on the table opposite him was what I knew at once from the description to be a phonograph. I had never seen one, and was much interested. I hope I did not keep you waiting, I said, but I stayed at the door as I heard you talking, and thought there was someone with you. Oh, he replied with a smile, I was only entering my diary. Your diary, I asked him in surprise. Yes, he answered. I keep it in this. And as he spoke, he laid his hand on the phonograph. I felt quite excited over it, and blurted out. Why, this beats even shorthand. May I hear it say something? Certainly, he replied with alacrity, and stood up to put it in train for speaking. Then he paused, and, and a troubled look overspread his face. The fact is, he began awkwardly, I only keep my diary in it, and as it is entirely, almost entirely, about my cases, it may be awkward. That is, I mean... He stopped and I tried to help him out of his embarrassment. You helped to attend dear Lucy at the end. Let me hear how she died. For all that I know of her, I should be very grateful. She was very, very dear to me. To my surprise, he answered with a horror-struck look in his face. Tell you of her death? Not for the whole wide world. Why not, I asked, for some grave, terrible feeling was coming over me again. He paused, and I could see that he was trying to invent an excuse. At length he stammered out. You see, I do not know how to pick out any particular part of the diary. Even while he was speaking, an idea dawned upon him. And he said with unconscious simplicity, in a different voice, and with the naivete of a child, That's quite true, upon my honest, honest Indian. I could not but smile at which he grimaced, though I gave myself away that time, he said. But do you know that although I have kept the diary for months past, it never once struck me how I was going to find any particular part of it, in case I wanted to look it up. By this time my mind was made up that the diary of the doctor who attended Lucy 
might have something to add to the sum of our knowledge of that terrible being. And I said boldly, Then, Dr. Seward, you had better let me copy it out for you on my typewriter. He grew to a positively deathly pallor, as he said, No, 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 for all the world I wouldn't let you know that terrible story. That it was terrible, my intuition was right. For a moment I thought, and as my eyes ranged the room, unconsciously looking for something or some opportunity to aid me, they lit on a great batch of typewriting on the table. His eyes caught the look in mine, and without his thinking, followed their direction. As he saw the parcel, he realised my meaning. You do not know me, I said. When you have read these papers, my own diary and my husband's also, which I have typed, you will know me better. I have not faltered in giving every thought of my own heart in this cause. But of course you do not know me, yet I must not expect you to trust me so far. He is certainly a man of noble nature. Poor dear Lucy was right about him. He stood up and opened a large drawer in which were arranged in order a number of hollow cylinders of metal covered with dark wax and said, you're quite right, I do not trust you because I did not know you. But I know you now and let me say that I should have known you long ago. I knew that Lucy told you of me, she told me of you too. May I make the only atonement in my power? Take the cylinders and hear them. The first half dozen of them are personal to me, and they will not horrify you, and you will know me better. Dinner will then be ready. In the meantime, I shall read over some of these documents, and we shall be better able to understand certain things. He carried the phonograph himself up to my sitting room and adjusted it for me. Now I shall learn something pleasant, I am sure, for it will tell me the other side of a true love episode of which I know one side already. Dr. Seward's Diary, 29th of September I was so absorbed in that wonderful diary of Jonathan Harker and that other of his wife that I let the time run on without thinking. Mrs. Harker was not down when the maid came to announce dinner, so I said, She's possibly tired, let dinner wait an hour. And I went on with my work. I just finished Mrs. Harker's diary, and she came in. She looked sweetly pretty, but very sad, and her eyes were flushed with crying. This somehow moved me much. Of late, I have had the cause for tears. God knows, but the relief of them was denied me. And now the sight of those sweet eyes, brightened with recent tears, went straight to my heart. So I said as gently as I possibly could, I greatly fear I have distressed you. Oh no, not distress me, she replied, but I have been more touched than I can say by your grief. That is a wonderful machine, but it is cruelly true. It told me in its very tones the anguish of your heart. It was like a soul crying out to Almighty God. No one must hear them spoken ever again. See, I have tried to be useful. I have copied out the words of my typewriter. And none other need now hear your heart beat as I did. No one need ever know, shall ever know, I said in a low voice. She laid her hand on mine and said very gravely, Ah, but they must. Must, but why, I asked. Because it is part of the terrible story, part of poor dear Lucy's death and all that led to it. Because in the struggle which we have before us to rid the earth of this terrible monster, we must have all the knowledge and all the help we can get. I think that the cylinders which you gave me contained more than you intended me to know. But I can see that there are, in your records, many lights to this dark mystery. You will let me help, will you not? I know all up to a certain point, and I see already though your diary only took me to the 7th of September, how poor Lucy was beset, and how her terrible doom was being wrought out. Jonathan and I have been working day and night since Professor Van Helsing saw us. He has gone to Whitby to get more information, and he will be here tomorrow to help us. We need have no secrets amongst us. Working together and with absolute trust, we can surely be stronger than if some of us were in the dark. 
she looked at me so appealingly and at the same time manifested such courage and resolution in her bearing that i gave in at once to her wishes you shall i said do as you like in the matter god forgive me if i do wrong there are terrible things yet to learn of but if you have so far travelled on the road to poor lucy's death you will not be content i know to remain in the dark nay the end the very end may give you a gleam of peace come there is dinner we must keep one another strong for what is before us we have a cruel and dreadful task when you have eaten you shall learn the rest and i shall answer any questions you ask if there be anything which you do not understand though it was apparent to us who were present mina harker's journal twenty ninth of september after dinner i came with dr seward to his study he brought back the phonograph from my room and i took my typewriter he placed me in a comfortable chair and arranged the phonograph so that i could touch it without getting up and showed me how to stop it in case i should want to pause then he very thoughtfully took a chair with his back to me so i might be as free as possible and began Hello? to read i put the fork metal to my ears and listened when the terrible story of lucy's death and and all that followed was done i lay back in my chair powerless fortunately i am not of a fainting disposition when dr seward saw me he jumped up with a horrified exclamation and hurriedly taking a case bottle from a cupboard gave me some brandy which in a few minutes somewhat restored me my brain was all in a whirl and only that there came through all of the multitude of horrors the holy ray of light that my dear lucy was at last at peace i do not think i could have borne it without making a scene it is all so wild and mysterious and strange that if i had not known jonathan's experience in transylvania i could not have believed it as it was i didn't know what to believe so i got out of my difficulty by attending to something else i took the cover off my typewriter and said to dr seward let me write this all out now we must be ready for dr van helsing when he comes i've sent a telegram to jonathan to come on here when he arrives in london from whitby in this matter dates are everything and i think that if we get all our material ready and have every item put in chronological order we shall have done much you tell me that lord godalming and mr morris are coming too let us be able to tell him when they come he accordingly set the phonograph in a slow pace and i began to typewrite from the beginning of the seventh cylinder i used manifold and so took three copies of the diary just as i had done with all the rest it was late when i got through but i heard dr seward went about his work of going his round of the patient and when he had finished he came back and sat near me reading so that i did not feel too lonely whilst i worked how good and thoughtful he is the world seems full of good men even if there are monsters in it before i left him i remembered what jonathan put in his diary of the professor's perturbation at reading something in an evening paper at the station at exeter so seeing that dr seward keeps his newspapers i borrowed the files of the westminster gazette and the pall mall gazette and took them to my room I remember how much the Daily Graph and the Whitman Gazette, of which I had made cutting, helped us to understand the terrible events at Whitby when Count Dracula landed. So I shall look through the evening papers since then, and perhaps we shall get some new light. I'm not sleepy, and the work will help to keep me quiet. Dr. Seward's Diary, 30th of September. Mr. Harker arrived at nine o'clock. He got his wife's wire just before starting. He is uncommonly clever, if one can judge from his face, and full of energy. If this journal be true, and judging by one's own wonderful experiences, it must be. He is also a man of great nerve. That going down to the vault a second time was a remarkable piece of daring. After reading his account of it, I was prepared to meet a good specimen of manhood but hardly the quiet business-like gentleman who came here today later 
After lunch, Harker and his wife went back to their own room. And as I passed a while ago, I heard a click of the typewriter. They're at hard at it. Mrs. Harker says they are knitting together, in chronological order, every scrap of evidence they have. Harker has got the letters between the consignees of the boxes at Whitby and the carriers in London who took charge of them. He is now reading his wife's typescript of my diary. I wonder what they will make out of it. Here it is. Strange that it never struck me that the very next house might be the Count's hiding place. Goodness knows that we had enough clues for the conduct of the patient Renfield. The bundle of letters relating to the purchase of the house were with the typescript. Oh, if we had only had them earlier, we might have saved poor Lucy. Stop, that way madness lies. Harker has gone back and is again collating his material. He says that by dinner time they will be able to show a whole connected narrative. He thinks that in the meantime I should see Renfield as hitherto he has been a sort of index to the coming and going of the Count. I hardly see this yet, but when I get to the dates I suppose I shall. What a good thing that Mrs Harker can put my cylinders into type. We never could have found the dates otherwise. I found Renfield sitting placidly in his room, with his hands folded, smiling benignly. At the moment he seemed as sane as anyone I ever saw. I sat down and talked on a lot of subjects, all of which he treated naturally. He then, of his own accord, spoke of going home, a subject he has never mentioned to my knowledge during his sojourn here. In fact, he has spoke quite confidently of getting his discharge at once. I believe that had I not had the chat with Harker and read the letters and the dates of his outbursts, I should have been prepared to sign for him after a brief time of observation. As it is, I am darkly suspicious. All those outbreaks were in some way linked with the proximity of the Count. What then does this absolute content mean? Can it be that his instinct is satisfied as to the vampire's ultimate triumph? Stay, he is himself the Sulphagus, and in his wild ravings outside the chapel door of the deserted house, he always spoke of master. This all seemed confirmation of our idea. However, after a while I came away, my friend is just a little too sane at present, to make it safe to probe him too deep with questions. He might begin to think, and then, so I went away. I mistrust these quiet moods of his. So I have given the attendant a hint to look closely after him, and to have a straight waistcoat ready in case of need. Jonathan Harker's journal, September the 29th, in a train to London. When I received Mr. Billington's courteous message that he would give me any information in his power, I thought it best to go down to Whitby and make, on the spot, such inquiries as I wanted. It was now my object to trace that horrid cargo of the Count's to its place in London. Later, we may be able to deal with it. Billington's junior, a nice lad, met me at the station and brought me to his father's house, where they decided that I must stay the night. They are hospitable, with true Yorkshire hospitality. Give a guest everything, and leave him free to do as he likes. They all knew that I was busy, and that my stay was short, and Mr Billington had already in his office all the papers concerning the consignment of boxes. It gave me almost a turn to see again one of the letters which I had seen on the Count's table before I knew of his diabolical plan. Everything had been carefully thought out and done systematically with precision. He seemed to have been prepared for every obstacle which might be placed by accident in the way of his intentions being carried out. To use an Americanism, he had taken no chances, and the absolute accuracy with which his instructions were fulfilled was simply the logical result of his care. I saw the invoice and took note of it. Fifty cases of common earth, 
to be used for experimental purposes. Also the copy of a letter to Carter Patterson and their reply. Of both of these I got copies. This was all the information Mr Billington could give me. So I went down to the port and saw the coast guards, the customs officers, the harbour master. They all had something to say in the way of the strange entry of the ship, which is already taking its place in local tradition. But no one could add to the simple description, 50 cases of common earth. I then saw the station master, who had kindly put me in communication with the men who had actually received the boxes. The tally was exact with the list. They had nothing to add except that the boxes were men and mortal heavy and that the shifting of them was dry work. One of them added that it was hard lines that there wasn't any gentleman, such like yourself, squire, to show some sort of appreciation of their efforts in liquid form. And another put in a rider that the thirst then generated was such that even the time which had elapsed had not completely allayed it. Needless to add, I took care before leaving to lift forever and adequately this source of reproach. 30th of September The station master was good enough to give me a line to his old companion, the station master at King's Cross, so that when I arrived there in the morning, I was able to ask him about the arrival of the boxes. He too put me at once in communication with the proper officials and I saw that their tally was correct with the original invoice. The opportunities of acquiring an abnormal thirst had been here limited. A noble use of them had, however, been made, and I was again compelled to deal with the result in an ex post facto manner. From thence I went on to Carter Patterson Central Office, where I met with the utmost courtesy. They looked up the transition in their day book, and letter book, and at once telephoned to their King's Cross office for more details. By good fortune, the men who did the teaming were waiting for work, and the official at once sent them over, sending also by one of them the way bill and all the papers concerned with the delivery of the boxes at Carfax. Here again, I found the tally agreeing exactly. The carrier's men were able to supplement the paucity of the written words with a few details. These were, I shortly found, connected almost solely with the dusty nature of the job and of the consequent thirst engendered in the operators. On my affording an opportunity, through the medium of the currency of the realm, of allying at a later period this beneficial evil, one of the men remarked, That there house, Governor, is the rummiest I was ever in. Long of me, but ain't been touched since hundred years. It was dust that thick that a place you might have slept on it without hurting your bones, and a place that was that when neglected you might have smelt old Jerusalem in it. But the old chapel, that took the kite, that did. Me and my mate, we thought we would never get out quick enough. <sighs> Lord, I wouldn't take less nor a quid a moment to stay there after dark. Having been in the house, I can well believe him, but if he knew what I knew, he would, I think, have raised his terms. Of one thing I am now satisfied, that all the boxes which arrived at Whitby from Varna in the Demeter were safely deposited in the old chapel at Carfax. There should be fifty of them, unless any have since been removed, as from Dr Seward's diary, I fear. I shall try to see the carter who took away the boxes from Carfax when Renfield attacked them. By following up this clue, we may learn a good deal. Later, Mina and I have worked all day, and we have put all the papers into order. Mina Harker's Journal, 30th of September I am so glad that I hardly know how to contain myself. It is, I suppose, the reaction from the haunting fear which I have had at this terrible affair and the reopening of his old wound might act detrimentally on Jonathan. I saw him leave for Whitby with as brave a face as I could, but I was sick with apprehension. The effort, however, has done him good. He was never so resolute, never so strong, never so full of volcanic energy as at present. 
It is just as that dear good Professor Van Helsing said. He is true grit, and he improves under a strain that would kill a weaker nature. He came back full of life and hope and determination. We have got everything in order tonight, and I feel myself quite wild with excitement. I suppose one ought to pity anything so hunted as the Count. That's just it. This thing is not human, not even beast. I've read Dr. Seward's account, poor Lucy's death and what followed. It's enough to dry up the springs of pity in one's heart. Later. Lord Godalming and Mr. Morris arrive earlier than expected. Dr. Seward was out on business and taken Jonathan with him, so I had to see them. It was to me a painful meeting, for it brought back all poor dear Lucy's hopes of only a few months ago. Of course they had heard Lucy speak of me, but it seemed that Dr. Van Helsing too has been quite blowing my trumpet, as Mr. Morris expressed it. Poor fellows, neither of them is aware how I know all about the proposals they made to Lucy. They did not quite know what to say or do, as they were ignorant of the amount of my knowledge, so they had to keep on neutral subject. However, I thought the matter over and came to the conclusion that the best thing I could do would be to post them in affairs right up to date. I knew from Dr. Seward's diary that they had been at Lucy's death, her real death, and that I need not fear to betray any secret before the time. So I told them as well as I could that I had read all the papers and diaries and that my husband and I, having typewritten them, had just finished putting them in order. I gave each of them a copy to read in the library. When Lord Godalming got his and turned it over, it does make a pretty good pile, he said. Did you write all of this, Mrs Harker? I nodded and he went on. I don't quite see the drift of it, but you of all people are so good and kind and have been working so earnestly and energetically that all I can do is accept your ideas blindfold and try to help you. I've had one lesson already in accepting facts that should make a man humble for the last hour of his life. Besides, I know you love my poor Lucy. Here he turned away and covered his face with his hands. I could hear the tears in his voice. Mr. Morris, with instinctive delicacy, just laid a hand for a moment on his shoulder and then walked quietly out of the room. I suppose there is something in a woman's nature that makes a man free to break down before her and express his feelings on the tender or emotional side without feeling it derogatory to his manhood. For when Lord Godalming found himself alone with me, he sat down on the sofa and gave way utterly and openly. I sat down beside him and took his hand. I hope he didn't think it forward of me, and if he ever thinks of it afterwards, he never will have such a thought. There I was wrong, Henry. I know he never will. He is too true a gentleman. I said to him, for I could see that his heart was breaking, I love dear Lucy, and I know that what she was to you, and what you were to her. She and I were like sisters, and now she is gone. Will you not let me be like a sister to you in your trouble? I know what sorrows you've had, though I cannot measure the depths of them. If sympathy and pity can help in your affliction, won't you let me be of some little service, for Lucy's sake? In an instant, the poor dear fellow was overwhelmed with grief. It seemed to me that all he had been late in suffering in silence found a vent at once. He grew quite hysterical and raising his open hands, beat his palms together in a perfect agony of grief. He stood up and then sat down again, and the tears rained down his cheeks. I felt an infinite pity for him, and opened my arms unthinkingly. With a sob, he laid his head on my shoulder, and cried like a weary child, whilst he shook with emotion. We women have something of the mother in us that makes us rise above smaller matters, when the mother spirit is invoked. I felt this big sorrowing man's head resting on me, as though it were that of a baby, that some day may lie on my bosom. I stroked his hair as though he were my own child. I never thought at the time how strange it all was. After a little bit his sobs ceased, and he raised himself with an apology, though he made no disguise of his emotion. He told me that for the days and nights past, 
weary days and sleepless nights, he had been unable to speak with anyone, as a man must speak in his time of sorrow. There was no woman whose sympathy could be given to him, or with whom, owing to the terrible circumstances with which his sorrow was surrounded, he could speak freely. I know how I suffered, he said, as he dried his eyes, but I do not know, even yet, and none other can ever know, how much your sweet sympathy is, has been to me today. I shall know better in time, and believe me that though I am not ungrateful now, my gratitude will grow with my understanding. You will let me be like a brother, will you, for all our lives, for dear Lucy's sake. Dear Lucy's sake, I said, as we clasped hands. I am for your own sake, he added. For if a man's esteem and gratitude are ever worth the winning, you have won mine today. If ever the future should bring you a time when you need a man's help, believe me, you will not call in vain. God grant that no such time may ever come. God grant that no such time may ever come to you to break the sunshine of your life. But if it should ever come, promise me that you will let me know. He was so in earnest, and his sorrow was so fresh, that I felt I would comfort him, so I said, I promise. As I came along the corridor, I saw Mr Morris looking out of the window. He turned as he heard my footsteps. How is art? he said. And noticing my red eyes, he went on. Ah, I see you have been comforting him. Poor old fellow, he needs it. No one but a woman can help a man when he's in trouble of the heart. And he had no one to comfort. He bore his own trouble so bravely that my heart bled for him. I saw the manuscripts in his hand. I knew that when he read it he would realise how much I knew. So I said to him, I wish I could comfort all who suffer from the heart. Will you let me be your friend? And will you come to me for comfort if you need it? You will know later on why I speak. He saw that I was in earnest, and stopping, took my hand, raising it to his lips, and kissed it. It seemed but poor comfort to such a brave and selfish a soul, and impulsively I bent over and kissed him. The tears rose in his eyes, there was a mandatory choking in his throat, and he said quite calmly, Little girl, you will never regret that true-hearted kindness, so long as you ever live. And he went into the study to his friend. Little girl, the very words he had used to Lucy, but oh, he proved himself a friend. End of chapter 17